region known as the Crownlands was never actually a kingdom, despite being formed by Westeros' first king. It had been claimed, the region itself that is, but never properly developed by a number of rulers over the preceding eons. But it took Aegon and his sisters to finally maximize the potential of the place. But before it became the capital region of the New Seven Kingdoms, before the Iron Throne was forged in Dragonfire, the region that became the Crownlands was the land base of operations, the jumping off point, if you will, for the conquest. Before Aegon could march on Heron, before Visenya could march on the Vale, before Rhaenys and Oris could march on the Stormlands, and all the other places left to conquer, they needed to control their immediate surroundings. The Blackwater, Duskendale, Rosby, Stokeworth, Crackclaw Point, these are familiar names. And they mattered a lot back then, too. Perhaps more now, but still a lot back then. They were claimed by Argilac the Arrogant, the Storm King, and actually bent the knee to Heron, the King of Isles and Rivers. As we discussed in the last episode, it made sense to strike at an area that no one had a strong hold on. Aegon, Visenya, and Rainy subjugated the area with a variety of interesting results. King Argilac and King Heron mostly just allowed it to happen. And that might have actually made a certain kind of sense... Nor did they simply do nothing. They didn't just twiddle their fingers. They prepared for something you probably can't actually prepare for. But they didn't know that. They didn't know what they were up against. We'll discuss all that, why this might have been a smart plan or the best plan. Best doesn't mean smart. Sometimes it's just all you've got available. All that and more on this episode of History of Westeros Podcast. Hello and welcome, everybody. We're here to talk about the Crown Lands, more about Aegon's Conquest. We're getting set up for the destruction of Heron Hall. We thought we'd get to that today, but as I was writing, well, the tale grew in the telling, as it so often does. We actually changed the title of this one in advance. Probably won't be the only time that happens because of the nature of our reread, but we'll always be very prepared and have lots of detail and nerdy fun for you. That, of course, will not change. We've always been committed to that, and we'll maintain that. Live streams are always at 3 Eastern on YouTube. If you want to participate in the live chat and catch us while we're recording. Otherwise, every video is on YouTube and Spotify and audio only is available everywhere that you listen to podcasts. It's ad free if you listen on Patreon. Sean, so uh, I see you've got your Pulp Fiction shirt there, the dancing, non-dancing Sean's on your shirt. So you're like meta <laughs> dancing there. Yeah, this might be a more appropriate shirt for a Dance of Dragons episode. Like <laughs> red for the Targaryens, and there's, there would be some dragon dancing of her sorts. And... Yeah. And, you know, just like in a Dance with Dragons, everyone ends up dead, pretty much like Pulp Fiction. You know, half the characters end up dead. So <laughs> it's kind of fitting, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, Tommy Pappas has like a mashup. It's this shirt. But it's John and Danny dancing oh, in this scene pose, oh. which is so good. Because remember how he stabs her with the yeah the syringe in the heart, like John stabs. That's a in, good point. As well, I think. <laughs> <laughs> how about that? I never. That's a good point. I am wearing a Craghouse crab feeder mask shirt in honor of my upcoming Dragon Con costumes. Next week we won't have a new episode. We'll we'll play uh, an older one, and. O'Shea and I will be at Dragon Con, and why don't we take two seconds here to talk about what we're going to dress as? Because I, most years of Dragon Con, I have not done more than one costume. A lot of years, I didn't do any costumes. This year, I've got four, Yay! so it's a huge Whoa. change from from my normal. I'm doing uh, Alan as an Alan from Barbie, which has nothing to do with uh, Song of Ice and Fire, but the others Hi, Alan. are He's related. Alan. <laughs> I'm doing. Uh, two versions of Crab Feeder. I'm doing the upscale Crab Feeder, which I have a suit for. I did that at Ice and Fire Con, so it's pretty much the same one. I'm going to have a Blackfire tattoo and a few other things, some rings, and just look fancy, like wearing a suit with the mask. Then I'm going to actually do the regular Crab Feeder with the sores, the grayscale. Shay is helping me do that. Well, she's doing it. I'm not. I'm just yeah, yeah, no, other people put like... it on me. I can't really do it. And the it's mask. Like the latex. And the, the... It's pretty cool. Yeah, it looks really neat. We had we posted some on Instagram to see what it would show what it looked like. And yeah, it's going to look gnarly in a good way. I saw those posts, but I wasn't sure what it was for. Now it all yeah, makes sense. Yeah, it's for yeah. crab feeder. Yeah, I was using liquid latex and body paint, face paint, you know, all that. To... And paper towels. Is the yeah, trick. Paper it makes it look Phoenix really to, like to add stabby. Texture. The, the rough texture. Yeah, it adds stuff and you like wrinkle. Anyways, it's yeah, it really looks, fun, it but really it, it'll good. take a while. Yeah, and then last but not least, I'm doing. Better call Drogo. 
Yes, we have a which I have done before, but it was like ten years ago. (laughs) (laughs) So this one's a little different than the first version. Uh, similar though. I fully support that. You can see my Better Call Saul yeah. poster behind yeah. me. Here. Instead of a the 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 belt, the like studded belt that he's got, I'm gonna have a bunch of neckties tied around my waist instead to make a sash. <laughs> so that's the concession to office attire. But okay. we'll have the blue stripes on a on a suit jacket. Yeah. And like- a shea. Yeah, I well first I'll say my shirt since we all started saying our shirts. I'm wearing a Peep Show shirt, which is one of my favorite shows, the British show. Um, and it says I'm not sick, but I'm not well. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so I have that shirt on for for Dragon Con itself. I have a lot of costumes. First Thursday night, I'm doing a half version of Poison Ivy. They have a bunny hutch event there, so that's a Hugh Hefner's like a <laughs> smoking jacket and that hat and stuff. Um, then I'm wearing my Expanse jumpsuit on Friday, Sam Rosenberg, and then changing out of that into an emo night outfit because my friend is doing an emo night party. So I'm doing a uh, Severa from the game Fire Emblem and I designed like band t-shirts for that. And then Saturday I'm doing the character Yunaka also from Fire Emblem for the <laughs> Nintendo shoot. And then um, gonna do Rainbow Barbie, so that's like the cowgirl Barbie fit from the movie, but with like rainbow accents. And then Sunday, I'm doing a rainbow variant of Spider Gwen from you know Into the Spider Verse, Across the Spider Verse, and all that, but um, custom printed with uh, rainbow accents, and that's gonna be really cool. The Spider Gwen looks really good. It looks so much like the real like the actual spider gwen it's amazing yeah yeah i'm very very excited about that if we wear a spidey suit um and also we'll be going to the game of thrones shoot on saturday and the world of ice and fire shoot on friday so lots of photos yeah so if you're if you're going to dragon con and you want to find a place to find us go to those shoots and we'll be walking around mingling and you can say hi i'm gonna get lots of photos and video content for social media um, with all the cosplay that I see. Yeah, so it should be great. Look uh, look out for some of that stuff next week. Oh, it's Tracker Shea. Was that six? Yeah, I think it's six. six. Different... I think it's six different things I remember counting. Yeah. One, <laughs> two, maybe five. Five different things, actually, yeah. You had to step it up a little if he's doing four. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> you can't let me catch up, yeah. <laughs> uh... <laughs> well, shout out to our good friend Nina. Her notes are all over this episode, as they so often are. The latest post on her blog, which is goodqueenally.tumblr.com. That's one L in Alley. And, the yeah, the latest post is on Dana and Baylor, Baylor the Blessed and Dana the Defiant. Why were they set to be married? What caused that arrangement to happen? It's a little unusual when you look at it because Baylor wasn't the firstborn son. And Dana was, you know, the from a different branch and it kind of made sense that to do different things differently anyway let nina explain it better than i would she really likes uh responding to this particular type of question which is about a song of ice and fire marriages and and why and what it meant and and the, the fallout or upside to all those things so it's a very detailed post i enjoyed reading it and i suspect you will too so check it out throughout yeah go ahead i want to Give a shout out to Lady Ray. One of our listeners made a, a point in the, the chat. We, we we talked a lot about the idea that there was probably more behind Aegon's plan than than is known or revealed. It's probably more than just I have dragons, I'm taking over, right? We talked a lot about like the the sort of plotting he would have had to do to think about how the different leaders would uh, react to his attack, you know, uh, what he wants the state of the Westeros to be after he takes over the idea of how taking down Heron first makes it so the other dominoes will probably fall to him. Mm-hmm. Well, she pointed out that there, some of this other planning, it, it, you know, it, I feel pretty confident it certainly happened. He had a master plan. It wasn't just, oh, I guess today's the day I'll take my dragons. And he probably was planning <laughs> for a long time, time things just right. Uh, I had some chess pieces, moves in advance, plotted out how it was going to go. And she suggested that even if some of those plans might have been more known or even public or could have been spied on or, or guessed at or whatever, that no one was paying attention to them. They didn't consider them a real threat. And so no one was writing this down, right? There, there were no maesters taking note, right? Until after he's there with dragons beating Heron, and then everyone's like, oh, all right, we need to keep record of this for history. But there probably would have been, if they had been keeping record all along, 
better evidence of how well he had this all planned out. I'm not sure I agree with that. I think it's just that the sources were probably not maintained or not lost or that George didn't write them is the, obviously, obviously the, rain, the main thing. But we yeah. don't have to. We can ignore the, the, the real world explanation because the Maesters do record almost everything. Like that's part of what they do. We, we, we know that. Uh, I mean, some of them are absurd about it. Like we have that example of the Maester on the wall that recorded every time the Lord Commander woke up and used the bathroom <laughs> and was just like extremely, no, you know, I think that maybe the notes were, maybe these notes weren't taken. Maybe Aegon didn't want them written down. There's other explanations. Mm -hmm. I think, I think it's worth exploring. I'm not sure it's simply that the Maester didn't think it was noteworthy though. I don't, I, I'm, I'm skeptical that they would decide not to write down something as important as this if they're writing down things like when people go to the bathroom. <laughs> well, they may have also not had access to what he's playing. No, he had, a maester. he had a maester, so. Oh, did he? Oh, yeah, really? all the lords of Westeros have maesters. It. Yeah, always. Yeah, that's not a new thing. Every lord okay. and every, if you're, it's kind of like a sign of your status. If you're a high enough ranked lord to get a maester, well, you're a high enough ranked lord. But yeah, Aegon, of course, was. <laughs> yeah, they had, they had maesters for sure. Do we know his name? Were they I mean, there were the been Citadel? lots of maesters. Well, yeah, all maesters come from the Citadel, so yes, mm -hmm. it would have come from there. But no, we don't know their we don't know their names. Like, I wonder if the Citadel chose someone and said, "Hey, you go check out this Aegon guy," or if Aegon said, "Hey, Citadel, give me a maester now." I wonder what the yeah, absolutely, yeah, I would wonder about that too. You'd think that they might choose carefully because of it's an unusual situation, and I don't know if, and there would have been several because you know the obviously there's a hundred years of Targaryens before yeah, so there would have been probably a maester for. Aenar the Exile, but maybe not. Maybe they there would have been a point at which that started, and it may not have started right away. But I assume by the time Aegon, it would have. Because Aegon had a maester with him. For example, Aegon has a maester with him when he treats with Heron. It, it even says both had maesters, so we have the exact mm, yeah. words written, you know. So, yeah, it's a, but either way, you know, my opinion aside, it is a super interesting topic. Like, what other things would they observe, and, and would Aegon have kept... Yeah, he might not have trusted the maesters. Like, the system is new to him. Like, a lot of Westerosi lords are used to having maesters around, but this might not be something they're used to, and they might be skeptical of, like, well, is he telling the Citadel? Like, I don't know. Maybe we don't want him to know some of these things, so. The maester wasn't in the inner circle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do they trust him or not? Yeah, who's he sending letters to? So, yeah, uh, great question, Lady Ray. Great point. Uh, great discussion uh, tidbit there. Throughout the episode, we'll encounter topics that we've done full episodes on, and we'll point them out as we go along and at the end, so you can check those out if you want to stay immersed in Westeros and the wonderful world of A Song of Ice and Fire. That list is at the end, along with this answer to the trivia question. In Fire and Blood, we meet the Muppet Tullys, but way back in A Game of Thrones, George R. R. Martin gave us the Three Stooges. They were men at arms for what house? Hmm, yes, three men named after the Three Stooges. It's not their exact names. They're not Larry, Moe, and Curly. They are similarly named. What house were they sworn to? I went for George to name Atoli Muppa. Muppa. Muppa, Muppa Tully. Muppa Tully. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. The time came for hostility to begin. Aegon had built the Aegon Fort. Rather, his people did. He did, probably didn't participate in the construction at all. And they established their beachhead and, and got the submission of a couple of local lords. But most of the big ones came shortly after. And no one interfered with them. We pointed that out last time. Maybe that was a big mistake, but maybe it made a certain kind of sense. They could have ganged up on the Targaryens, but, you know, better late than never or not? Nope, never. It, le it never is what happened, basically. <laughs> so... Unmolested, they just went about building this, what would be called the Crown Lands. We don't know when it was named the Crown Lands. We don't know when the final, like, legal paperwork was drawn up to define it the way it finally is. So we don't really have that. We assume that mostly was dealt with early in Aegon's reign. But we here's where it started to be formed. And that will be the most of the focus today. We might get into the beginnings of the conflict directly with Heron. But even these vassals that immediately surrendered... Well, they were, most of them were Heron's vassals, and they just went over to Aegon without a fight or without any sort of, or with very little fight. In the case of Rhaenys going to Rosby, there literally was no fight. They just said, okay, I see your dragon. We already knew you were coming is probable. Like, they probably knew about the landing and had obviously heard about the claim that Aegon sent the ravens out. The word would have spread to them by now. 
So they were probably ready for this. Visenya went to Stokeworth. I think I mentioned this one last time real briefly. They shot a few crossbow bolts at her, maybe just so they could say they had done something to resist. And Visenya set their roof on fire, and they were like, okay, that's it. We're done resisting. Meanwhile, what they probably should have done much sooner, and with far more allies, finally happened. Someone finally took action and tried to stop Aegon. Quote, The Conqueror's first true test came from Lord Darklin of Duskendale and Lord Mooton of Maidenpool, who joined their power and marched south with 3,000 men to drive the invaders back into the sea. Aegon sent Ori's Baratheon out to attack them on the march, whilst he descended on them from above with the Black Dread. Both lords were slain in the one-sided battle that followed. Darklin's son and Mooton's brother thereafter yielded up their castles and swore their swords to House Targaryen. Unlike most battles of the Conquest, this one is definitely under-described. The Field of Fire is pretty well described. What happens at Harrenhal is pretty well described. The Last Storm is extremely well described. There isn't much of a battle in... The veil, <laughs> but what happens is well described. So it's not what makes the conquest interesting, these a lot of these battles, because well, how the dragons are used is interesting because we might get to see them later. But some of these battles are, as it says, kind of one sided, and that well, in some ways that might make the Maesters or George think it's not as interesting. I kind of disagree. I kind of wonder like what it's like. Put yourself in the place of one of these foot soldiers whose lords, like, you wish you fought for Lord Stokeworth, who gave up after a few shots of crossbow bullets. You're like, you don't want to f- go down with this ship. This guy's like, yeah, let's let's fight the dragon. Let's do it. Let's be brave and stop these Targaryens. And, oof, yeah. Or even Argilac, who just goes out on his own, like, I'll just fight you myself, rather than <laughs> sending all his armies into their suicidal death. Yeah, Argilac, at least he's like, well, I want a death. Like, he knows he's lost, and he wants a noble death. Like, what are these guys doing? I don't quite get, like, they haven't known. They didn't know they'd lost. Like, they would have known, maybe knew as soon as their army lines were drawn up and they saw Valerian. But it's not too late to surrender at that point. Say, so never mind. Like, Aegon would, would raise them back up and probably let them keep their seats. But they were just, I don't know if they really feared Heron. Uh, they, they didn't want to, they thought that this upstart wouldn't succeed. And they, if they didn't do their duty as vassals that Heron would punish them. And Heron's pretty nasty. Like he's cruel and and tyrannical. So I can understand that being the primary motivation here. Like, I don't think it was just bravado and bluster. I think it was, they were caught between a, a Heron, the black and the black dread. And I guess they (laughs) chose wrong (laughs) because yeah. I wonder, you know, we, we talked a little in the past about the idea that, people might not have really understood the nature of the dragons. Yeah. Right. And so some people might literally just think it's a myth or a rumor that there's not really a dragon. If there is, maybe they're just a little dragon and not that big deal. They can shoot it down. Even a big dragon, even when they see it, they might not really believe that it breathes fire. Like, <laughs> I, like even yeah. like in a real world, something like a pterodactyl seems almost silly, you know, like yeah. it, it, just to see it flying around in modern times, but we know they're real, but what if it also breathes fire, right? Like, <laughs> no, it doesn't really breathe fire, but then it does, and then you're all dead. So, you know, I, I wonder if that's one one aspect of what they were underestimating. Or does it, like, little, breathe a little breath. bit of fire that's not that threatening? Yeah. You know, okay, it yeah. can get going. Its breath is really hot. It's not actually fire. Yeah, yeah, you can see how these things are exactly How far the blast is, how yeah. hot it is, how long, how sustained it can be, and so on, yeah. Or if they knew more about it, if you look at the flip side of that coin, and they actually have some knowledge of dragons, they might think, well, a dragon isn't going to be very useful in a smaller conflict whenever all the men are close together. Like, how does Balerion tell friend from foe? Mm-hmm. Balerion doesn't recognize banners. It's one thing at the Field of Fire when the enemy lines are just rows and rows and rows and rows deep. When it's 30,000 troops yeah. versus 3,000, it's a little easier for the dragon to just go get all those 30,000. Or if you're just there. burning the castle, that's also pretty straightforward yeah, yeah. for Harrenhal and, some, and, and a lot of these castles in Dorne. But here, yeah, you've got relatively small armies. We know Aegon didn't have very many men yet. He had 1,500, 2,000, maybe 3,000 at most. Not, Which is not that large, of course, for an instrument of conquest. It leaves much to be desired. But Balerion, of course, by himself does a lot. So if we're imagining it, like, who? imagine being a foot soldier. So you, even if they 
even if the lords know a lot about the dragons, or regardless of their knowledge of the dragons, the, fo the foot soldiers probably know Jack. <laughs> so they're being called up to fight. They're like, what's going on? You know, we're fighting against this, this dragon lord guy. What's that all about? Like, that sounds a little intimidating, but maybe I don't know what to expect. And they get there and they see the soldiers and they're like, okay, we outnumber them. We're doing good. And then all of a sudden this shadow passes over. Maybe it comes behind them and it goes straight for the lord on his horse sitting behind, you know, on the, on a hill. Or maybe it lands and does battle on the ground like Meraxes does at the last storm. I don't know, but those men were brave if they didn't run away immediately. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the only time Aegon and Ori's fought together in the same battle that we know of. There may have been some smaller skirmish that was so small that... It didn't even bear a mention. But yeah, as far as we know, this is the only time they fought together. They trained together as boys, so it might have been kind of a neat little moment afterwards. Like, yeah, that's what we trained for. You know, we actually did it for real this time. So it would have been a testing ground, though, for as much as the the army was effective, as much as we knew Balerion would be effective, as much as Aegon and his sisters knew that. They still didn't know exactly how they hadn't, you know, until you actually do it, you don't know exactly how it's going to go. Sure, they knew they had the advantage, but seeing Balerion in the midst of all these troops or whatever it was he did, it would have been the first time that Aegon led his troops and led troops of his own in Westeros. He had seen what Balerion could do in the war against Volantis during the Century of Blood. Although, as far as we know, that was just burning ships. I don't know if he had any conflicts on land. It's, so maybe not. So maybe this was a new and a different way in that sense, too. So maybe the first time he took on infantry in any sort of sizable numbers, which is pretty significant. He would have learned from that. He would, it would have affected his future plans, might have given him more confidence, or he might have just been so confident in the first place. He's like, yep, that's exactly what I expected. We won pretty easily. That's how it's going to continue to go. And he just, <laughs> the ball just keeps rolling with that supreme and well-deserved confidence, I suppose. Nina adds, this battle may have also represented draw potential drawbacks to draconic combat. Dragons are incredibly effective at wiping out large swaths of enemies, but with Aegon's own troops under Oris on the ground, he may have burned some of his own men. He may have, the, Balerion may have, his tail may have hit some of his own people. This may have been part of the test. This may have been why it wasn't written about that much. Maybe Aegon didn't want it written about that he actually killed some of his own men while first learning how to use Balerion in ground combat. That would be a thing to kind of keep on the down low. That's not exactly going to bring men to your side. <laughs> That's still an issue in modern warfare. That's friendly still fire. Friendly fire. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and a lot of times you think of that as, you know... <laughs> Literally fire in this like, case. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you know, sometimes it's like one soldier with his rifle is shooting down range and there's other allies also down range and he may can't see or distinguish good or bad or whatever. But more often than not, it comes from like artillery and mm. aircraft, stuff like that. Just, to, just blowing up a whole area that there were troops in, even with like all the modern technology, satellite imagery, everything. We still do that sometimes. Like just imagine flying around in a dragon. He's got no way to talk to the commander on the ground. The commanders on the ground have no way to, let him know where the positions are. So mm. I imagine that would have been an issue, some amount of either holding back or figuring it out or, or just killing some people accidentally. It's, it's got to have been something that they were working on that he might not have been very public with the maesters about. Yet. Nina's suggestion, <laughs> uh, one of her suggestions here is, is good. It's like if, if Aegon was being very cautious, he might have just planned to use Balerion just to scare them, just fly him over the battle lines and the other men are going to be like, holy sh... And they just run because <laughs> it's way bigger and more intimidating than they expected like the stories are true it actually is it's large enough to swallow an oryx hole or whatever like oh my god it, I, I thought that was an, uh, just a story and no look at that thing it really its mouth is that large yeah maybe even just blasting fire that doesn't hit anyone just shooting it overhead just look just what's like... coming yeah just like firing a bullet in the air if you're firing your gun in the air and no one else has a gun that's very intimidating <laughs> everyone's like all right this person's in charge now yeah, yeah or if they never even heard of a gun before they're like what the hell is that thing you know like oh, wow <laughs> So this is a, more like a large, you know, aircraft platform mount with a huge gun mounted on it rather than just a gun. Mm. So <laughs> heavily armored flying machine. Yeah, just unbelievable. So it, it will have been really interesting for them to make use of what they learned in this first incursion. It's almost like a good for them to have like a smaller testing battle before they get to some real ones. Another thing they could have just done is say, 
Balerion could just fly right over the battle and keep going. And they're like, I'm going to... The implication being, I could just go burn your town right now. You marched out of Maidenpool. Yeah. You marched out of Duskendale. Or not Duskendale. Um, wait, was it Duskendale? Yeah, Duskendale and Maidenpool. And just fly right over them and go, yeah, I could just go burn your town right now. And there's nothing you could do about it. That's just how much of an edge we have. That might be enough to be like, we've made a huge mistake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the Targaryen allied troops might not have seen the dragons in action yet either until now. Nina six is maybe some of them were veterans of Aegon's service in the century of blood, but if it was just him flying Valerian over there and burning ships, then he might not have had any of his foot soldiers may have participated at all. So it's entirely possible that this was the first time there. And then that would have given them confidence. Unless of course there were some friendly casualties, then they'd be a little wary, but overall they'd be like, Sure is good to be on this side. Wow, that thing. <laughs> we just, we can't lose. You know, that would give his men a lot of their first time seeing it in action. They'd be like, yeah. Because even if there were some veterans of, that had seen Valerian in action in the Century of Blood, the vast majority of them would not have. That would be, you know, these would be new, new recruits or, yeah, he wasn't shipping lots of men over to Essos during that, as far as we know. Now, there's no mention of captured swords yet. The Iron Throne, as we know, he started capturing swords, making them turn them over or just pulling them off the battlefield, shipping them back to King's Landing or what's becoming King's Landing and starting to melt them down for the throne. There's no mention of that yet. So he probably didn't have the idea yet. There were certainly enough swords to at least get started here, but it's not mentioned yet. It looks like the first mention of that is after Hall. So it looks like that's when it began. So maybe Aegon had that idea then. It's always interesting to, to wonder if the Iron Throne figures in the dreams at all. Like, he fi he knows that his line has to be on the throne. It's not him. It's his line. And so is does the throne loom large in those dreams as, like, a symbol of that rule being in place? Or maybe he, maybe he just knew he needed some large symbol to... Anyway, it's... The throne... If you dreamt of that throne, <laughs> that would be like, whoa... <laughs> That was quite a dream I just had. And if you kept having it, you're like, yeah, I'm going to do that. Hmm. It might seem kind of abstract in a dream, too. Like, you might not fully understand what it is until after a battle, you see a bunch of swords melted and fused together. And then you're like, oh, that's what was in my dream. Yeah. He, Nina also suggests he didn't know, Aegon, that is, that he hadn't yet even decided about King's Landing. That's entirely possible. So where, let alone having a throne, where is it going to be? At this point... Some people, maybe even him, was thinking Duskendale. Why not just start out in Duskendale? It's a prosperous port city, uh, pr more properly a town, I suppose, but a prosperous spot near where King's Landing eventually goes. So it could have been a consideration. And I don't know, you wonder what the, the Darklands at that time were thinking like, no, don't take our town over for your new capital. This is ours, you know. Why not build down there? Maybe they suggested that. Like, you know, a real city by the mouth of the Blackwater would look great, y'all. You know, why don't you build mm -hmm. that? Yeah, because Duskendale is very significant, the largest trading port in the area. You have to go north to Gulltown to find, you know, a bigger trading spot. And at this point, that, you know, that's, that's pretty far away. And manpower and wealth-wise as well. Visenya didn't allow the sacking of Duskendale partly because they wanted it as an ally, but they were happy to take a lot of its wealth away and again give it to Aegon and, and use that for more fuel for the conquest. Maidenpool is a large town as well. They're probably similar in size. Maidenpool, uh, we've been to in A Song of Ice and Fire. Brienne goes there. And technically, it's not going to be in the Crownlands, though. It's the eastern border of the Riverlands. A little more on that later. It's interesting that Aegon didn't include it in his his own region. I wonder if it was like a check against the power of the Riverlands or he just wanted the Riverlands to, to have a certain level of strength to hold itself against the other regions because it's always in the middle. And I'm not sure. It's an interesting question, though. It, it probably doesn't make that much difference to him, but it's still manpower. I mean, if you're calling up the, the troops in the Crownlands, you would think he would want Maidenpool included in that. So he must have had a good reason to include it in the Riverlands. He might want the Riverlands to maintain the ability to call up their own tr their own banners, yeah, right? He doesn't want to completely uh, usurp them. Uh, it's, it's especially if it, it could easily be a sort of I don't know how to say it's a negotiating tool to to keep the Riverlands allied with him. Like, yeah. oh, you could let us keep Maidenpool. Thanks so much for that. Okay, yeah, that, that's true. And there's also just regular 
tradition to keep track of. You know, Maidenpool had been part of the Riverlands before, and that's what they're used to. And it's not broke. Don't fix it. That kind of situation. Just let it leave as much as is. Aegon's plan in general seems to be change as little as possible. Let them do what they were doing as much as possible. And that maybe to just maybe it's just as simple as that. It fits in with that whole idea, that plan, that that approach. Which adds to like you don't want every town you come up against to feel like they have no choice but to fight. Right. It's all or nothing. Like, no, you don't have to fight me. You could just keep being like you like you average soldiers and farmers, just keep living your life. I'm just gonna be in charge of these other lords who have been in charge of you. Like, I don't need to destroy your town. I don't need to take you over. Yeah, I didn't. Everything will be cool, man. Just be cool. And right? that's why I think they were afraid of Heron or just really overly duty oriented because otherwise they would much rather have Aegon as their lord, you would think. I mean, he's not, even though they don't, maybe not, don't, don't know much about him. They know a lot about Heron. And it's just like, if you roll the dice, you're probably going to get someone better than Heron. <laughs> you know, there's plenty <laughs> of lords you could have. You're like, well, we could do a lot worse than him, you know, but you can, you could. Heron's about as bad as it gets. So that's a worthy gamble there. So these are pretty big additions to the team, so to speak. We got Duskendale, Maidenpool, a dozen lords in total, we're told, have bent the knee to Aegon. We can assume, we don't know exactly which ones they are. We can assume some of them are those lords of uh, Massey's Hook, Stone Dance and Sharp Point, Bar Emin and, and Massey, that is, who had been vassals of Argilac. So already. House Targaryen has peeled off some of Aegon, uh, Argilac supporters and some of Herons. Herons, only Herons went with, took, uh, needed to fight, though, at this point, so far. Now, Visenya is eventually going to subjugate rather easily. It's not much of a fight required. Crackclaw Point, which will become part of the Crown Lands as well, but not yet. That has not actually happened yet. It's not going to happen until after the Field of Fire. Visenya's part in all this is interesting in that it's a little more piecemeal. She goes and takes part of the Vale. And then has to fly over to fight the Field of Fire before returning to the Vale to finish things off there. So, but we'll focus on more on her a bit later. So, as I said a minute ago, it's not clear exactly when all this was organized and when it was called the Crown Lands. But it's pretty clear that the things closest to King's Landing would be part of this new region. And maybe going a little farther out, it wasn't quite as clear. But that all would have been settled a bit later. You know, I just thought of something that I, I wonder if it had to do with something along the lines of a day's ride, like how mm, far from how far the, the king's rent will go. Yeah, that, yeah, that's often how these ancient distances are calculated because they don't have like feet and, and yards and aren't, you know, used very regularly <laughs> and not in a way that is universal. So, yeah, you're right. That's that's like the the kind of thing that someone would go like how many steps, how many sheep that can live on a certain amount of land that that's what counts as like how much how many people yeah. it can be it can support yeah these measurements are more like natural rather than based in some unit of measure it, and so that's why i'm wondering if maybe that's why we already suppose some other reasons but dusk and Dell or you know some any town that's kind of on the edge maybe they were just like past a day's travel or a week's travel yeah. or whatever it is so, yeah. and some of the other 12 are kind of easy to figure out we've got Antlers, ruled by House Buck Buckwell. We already said Rosby and Stokeworth. Duskendale was Darkland then. It's House Riker now. Hollard Hall, of course, has now been destroyed thanks to Ares' revenge for the defiance of Duskendale. But Hollard Hall would have been there then. The house, you know, with uh, the Hollard descendants and all that. Then Rook's Rest, held by House Staunton. And there's a Rosby Road from King's Landing to Duskendale. We're not sure if that road existed then. And Rosby's in between. Obviously, Dragonstone, Driftmark, and Claw Isle are part of it. Ashea is pulling the map up here. So you can see Blackwater Bay. You can see the basic area of the Crown Lands there. And uh, it should be pretty clear. And you can see all the major spots there marked by little castle indicators you can see sharp point and stone dance over there on massey's hook to the right slash east right north of that is dragonstone and driftmark and you can see king's landing which wasn't there at the time but it certainly tells you where the general idea is and all those things north rosby stokeworth duskendale hay or hayford and antlers yeah house sunglass would be in here somewhere 
we don't know where House Sunglasses Sweet Port Sound is actually located. So, but it would be in there somewhere. House Sunglass, you may remember House Sunglass because Melisandre burned the Lord of Sunglass <laughs> really early in, in Clash of Kings. And, of course, the Aegon Fort is what stands in for King's Landing at this point. And I can just assume, or we can safely assume, rather, that it's just constantly being added to. Like, all while these other events are happening, more and more people are moving to that area, more and more fortifications are being built, more and more businesses are opening, more settlers, etc. It's becoming a safer place, becoming more developed. That means more people are going to want to live there. Without any more major interference. I wonder if Aegon was surprised. It's just like, no one's coming for us. Or if this just goes to his supreme confidence, or maybe it's just what his dreams were telling him. Like, destiny, this is all fitting in with the destiny he expects. Now, here's another reason to wonder about why, or to explain, rather, why some people might have been reluctant to join Aegon, Visenya, and Rhaenys, despite all their uh, great strength with the dragons and extreme capability and confidence and all that which is that their line might have seemed a little fragile. Aegon didn't have any kids yet. That's a little... Eh, he didn't have a brother either, so it's not like there's someone else like that it would pass to Visenya if he died, and then, well, she would have to get married and have a child to continue that line. So it's just a little messy in that sense. There's no clear line of succession there, and there may not be one. As long, if you don't have kids... There, the doubt will be that you can't have kids, that you are sterile, or that, you, you know, that's a normal enough thing that happens in the real world and in Westeros that people just don't have kids, no matter how hard they try. It's just a fairly regular medical occurrence. And he's got two wives, so the proof is like double <laughs> than it would be otherwise. So it might be like, might be, no one's going to say this out loud, especially not to his face, at least, well, they would say it out loud if, you know, certain company, like, make sure no one's listening. Is he capable of having kids? Are we just going to bend the knee to this guy and then this whole kingdom's going to fall apart in a decade when he has no children and it just collapses on it in on itself? That's scary for these lords and ladies who are trying to decide what side to take. It's a tightrope walk of decision making. And that's really scary, not having a uh, the succession. Like you see how it was a big deal for Rob. They're like, Rob, you got to have a kid. You got to get married and get this started, man. You got to like when he was 16, they were pressing him for that. Aegon's like 27 at this point. This is pretty unusual. You know, this might be a little bit of a tangent, but what other Targaryens were there? Like, is there any thought that did he have like an uncle or a cousin or something? Is there not that we know of? Yeah, Targaryens and we know of nothing. Yeah, there, there's no, there shouldn't be any uncles. Uh, there might be a cousin or something out there, but no mention of anything. Like, they would have come up, you think. You know, his mom's alive, maybe, but she was a Valarian, not a Targaryen anyway. So she wouldn't exactly. I mean, she's relevant, but not to this particular question. And she might not have been alive. So even that is that's just kind of like, a well, I don't know. So there's a lot of unknowns here, which if there were no other cousins and we're pretty sure they're at most, that's the only thing there could be, I think, is a cousin because there's definitely no brother or uncle. Probably no. And there may have been an aunt, but I don't even know about that. And so that's about it. There's just cousins, the only possibility. And that doesn't seem to be the case. Like if there was a cousin, why didn't they, why didn't they have a dragon? Why didn't, you know, there, it just seems like they just didn't exist. It seems like there's too many, it, it, it's, un, it's unlike a lot of other family members. Like it's pretty easy to, to find another Baratheon or another Lannister, especially Lannister <laughs> really, or Gardner, <laughs> you know, but an extra Targaryen in this era is kind of hard to conceal between the lines you know it's like well no this would have been talked about why weren't they part of the conquest why didn't they have a dragon if they didn't have a dragon well why not like what's the reason there so there's all these uh, open questions so i i feel pretty strongly that it's not just a case of it not being recorded it's the fact that it's not recorded it does seem to tell us that it just didn't exist i don't know if there's room for it it's a clue in its own that it's not mentioned you know you know that uh I don't know if I hope we're not jumping too far ahead, but Nina talks a little bit about the, I don't know, the, the, the symbolicness of the crown itself. Yeah, yeah, we can talk about that. Right? So this is what happens here. Let's, okay. Let me set that up briefly. The coronation comes, we, we mentioned it before when he has his first coronation, but this is when it actually happens. After these first 12 lords or so surrender, they have a little ceremony. 
presumably those lords are present. And Visenya says those words that we discussed last time, noting the lack of the phrase House Targaryen and all that interesting stuff. So this is when that actually happens and he declares the small council. So we don't have to rehash that. We'll just place it here in our timeline. Now, Sean, what were you going to say about the crown? Well, e even that is worth... I'm glad you brought it up because it is kind of in line with what Nina's saying here. I'm not necessarily going to full detail. I don't mind if you want to. But, but just the idea that this question of how the line might succeed, he might be usurping that uh, by not talking about House Targaryen mm. and by this being a conqueror's crown. Like, mm. look, I'm just going to beat you militarily. Like, I'll, we can figure out succession later. That doesn't matter. That's not a factor. I'm going to rule this continent. It fits with his boss right? presentation, doesn't it, that we were saying before. Yeah. Just project extreme confidence. And yes, no, I'm ahead of you. I'm in front of you. It doesn't you don't, you don't have to worry about those things. That's for me to worry about. <laughs> yeah. Whether I can have kids or not, I'll just name someone to be my successor. My sister will do it. I'll, maybe I'll have a kid. Maybe I won't. None of that matters. I have an army. I have these dragons. I'm going to take Heron down and you're going to realize that you're next and that you're thankful <laughs> that I took Heron down. And this is just happening. You just don't see it yet, but this is happening. And details like that shouldn't, shouldn't matter to you. I like it. This, this dragon details, what should matter to you. It, you know? it does really fit with his, his attitude towards a lot of these things. I, I like that a lot. And it might've even been why he took this approach. Cause he knew that might be an issue. The idea that yeah. people might question the succession. So he just needs to not let that be an issue, right? Like I'm not, our family isn't taking over. I'm taking over. Right? <laughs> yes, yes. He will decide who the successor is. It may or may not be someone from his family. And that might be why, that th this might be why that was partly phrased that way because he didn't have a successor yet. So saying House Targaryen is in charge now might, that might be a, a corner he didn't want to paint himself into because he might have been right. worried he couldn't have kids, which is- yeah. I don't know how to square that with the dreams and saying his family has to be in charge. Like, well, how is that going to work out then if, if they're not, tar I don't know. I, maybe again, there's his sisters that could have children with somebody else. So it's not like he's the only, uh, the last bloodline. He's the last man of house Targaryen at that point. But yeah, there's still other possibilities. The crown being so simple is interesting. And it's kind of funny in a sense, like the irony of the iron throne being that a, cr a king shouldn't sit easily. Well, what's that old phrase, the crown shouldn't rest easy on the king's head? This is like the easiest crown to rest on someone's head. It's a Valyrian steel circlet. Valyrian steel is extremely light. <laughs> so this is like, ironically, the gaudy giant gold one that Aenys had made. He was not a very good king. He actually had a crown that fit that, <laughs> you know, that <laughs> metaphor. It didn't rest easy, probably. It was a giant gold thing. You got, you, that thing guarantee that thing was heavy as hell. Maybe all Aegon's was like a war crown. I think he'd wear in battle and not like mess him up or slow him down or anything. So it's kind of, yeah, kind of ironic. Which, I, as Nina points out, that it, it's sort of symbolic that he's not here as some sort of royalty or some fancy leader that was handed this, like he's seizing it. Yes. And he doesn't even need some trappings of fancy crowns to prove it he's got these dragons and, and furthermore she points out that the crown itself is made from valerian steel which is probably more rare than gold yeah and oh, usually yeah. used to make a sword and he's just wearing it like a crown like it just kind of shows it's sort of like however he means it to be or not it's just sort of an indication of how far ahead he is in resources and power and everything than everyone else uh, he doesn't need point. to show it off even though he kind of is showing it off, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's a great point about using a material best or perhaps more ideally suited for weapons. And he's like, no, I'm going to wear this on my head as a symbol of power instead. Even if it... Got enough weapons. Yeah, even yeah. if it isn't necessarily that much, because I'm guessing it didn't take a lot of Valyrian steel. But still, the stuff is wildly expensive and rare. And it had the rubies in it to give it a little bit of extra, you know weight both metaphorically and literally <laughs> maybe it would fly right off with a little need a little bit of weight or it'll just oh no <laughs> it fell right off the dragon you know like where did that go <laughs> you bolt that thing think on. about the wind up there yeah. when flying a dragon yeah you need to fasten there. that thing onto his helmet so <laughs> don't, don't let the like chin strap yeah crown chin strap <laughs> take any chances there <laughs> so yeah, so they probably had to melt something else down to, to do that. They probably had to rework it. I doubt they just had a Valyrian steel circle just sitting around ready for that. Like, crowns 
in old Valyria are probably frowned on. They were very anti kings and queens, so emperors or anything like that. Yeah, I'm guessing crowns were kind of a, a, a very bold fashion choice that were looked down on. We're, we're trying what, to call back what's to the, the, what's, what's the line between crown and circlet and tiara and like diadem? You know, like that's I, exactly the sort of fashion limits that the Valyrians would be testing amongst each other. Like, well, can I get away <laughs> with this thing? Is that a tiara or a crown? Or yeah. I remember that scene in in Rome, season one, where he's Caesar, which who's played by Char- Kieran Hines. Ciara? I always forget how to say that name. Kieran Hines, and uh, he's obviously Mance Raider. And he's he's as he's dressing for his triumph, which is his great celebration after conquering Gaul. So it's this huge state sponsored event that if you slay enough enemies, they put this you get to do this. And it's a huge deal. Like all the like most ambitious men in Rome always wanted one of these. And he's sitting there choosing his garments for it. And he's like his his like slaves and attendants are like, what about this one? He's like, it's a red, it's a deep red. He's like, it's a little too purple, a little too, because purple is the imperial color. He's like, no, I don't want to come off like I'm trying to be an emperor here. So he's very, he's choosing yet. his garment. Yeah, yet. He's like, no, that comes, <laughs> give me a few more year, give me another year before I do that. But it goes to show that like these higher ranking people, like the way they dress and the what, what that projects, it like it's, it, it sends a message and they're very careful at curtailing that message and, and making sure it's the message they want to send and not like, oh, I'm trying to conquer you. Or, or it is, I'm trying to conquer you. I mean, that, depending on the scenario, Caesar was not trying to say that, even though he was trying to do it. Whereas Aegon seems like he's pretty clearly just, I'm going to conquer you. You I'm in your face. I'm going to, like Sean said, there's, there's no hemming and hawing here. It's all, I'm going to dominate you. You don't, these other factors don't matter. (laughs) As to the no children thing, another factor in there that refers to something we talked about before, that's part of why he got those third wife offers too. Not only was it, well, maybe I will have a child. It's also an ambitious move. They're like, well, maybe if the, if the child that comes first comes from me, then my child is the heir to this new throne, this new entire dynasty. So that's a pretty big deal. I would want to get in on that if possible. And since that spot wasn't taken yet, a lot of people would want it. And that spot meaning, of course, the heir to the throne. Once again, I'll say we'll return to the topics of Aegon, Rhaenys, Visenya, and their stories individually and combined, but we'll stay focused on the conquest for now. However, I want to bring up Danny for a minute. When Danny arrives in Westeros, it looks like it's going to be chaotic. It looks like there's going to be several kings and queen and or queens still fighting for supremacy. Maybe Aegon slash Young Griff has settled things a bit. Maybe he's solidified things a bit started making some progress there but i seriously doubt that the lannisters will be completely defeated that the reach will be just copacetic with whatever's happening let alone dorn whatever's happening there dorn is they may have their marriage to him which might upset the reach or vice versa something could happen in other words all these kings and queens might be awfully distracted by each other to properly deal with danny Which is kind of the same scenario we have here. They probably should have ganged up on Aegon in their best interest. That might have been in their best interests. They should probably gang up on Danny when she comes. But I can see it going very similarly where they're all too busy dealing with each other or like, well, let him deal with it. Why should I expend my strength on this new invader when their first attack is against one of my enemies? Right? Like Tywin's argument that, well, if Mance Raider or or Balon Greyjoy wants to attack the North let them that's our enemies they're attacking we don't have to be allies with them you know there are a few uh (coughs) thoughts parallels that kind of bloom from this the idea that uh like i think you said earlier that the the different lords might have been too scared to to face the dragons But we've also talked about how they might not have even really been aware of the power of the dragons. I think they were more, they were as reluctant to work with each other as they were to face a dragon. Does that make sense? Yeah, Uh, yeah. Because that's just, that can be just as dangerous. Maybe not to their soldiers and their, and their lands, but to them personally, like an assassination or a political type maneuver, you know, something like that. Something getting close to somebody. or even a concession of weakness. Okay, yeah, or, sure. You know, on, on and on, right? Like, or even like a, grudges from the past. Mm-hmm. There's all kinds of reasons why they That's might not point. want to work with each other. That's a great point. And yeah. um, 
and, and and so that also could be similar when Danny shows up and it kind, kind of this overall theme that they're all squabbling over who should be in the Iron Throne. You know, when Aegon shows up, like he it's maybe far in the future and he's not telling them, but they are facing an existential threat right then. Never mind the dream. Right. Yeah. Um, same thing when Danny shows up, she might be like, look, you guys don't understand. Like the fact that you, the, the parallel here, the fact that you couldn't team up to stop me means you're not going to team up to stop the White Walkers, yes, right? So yes. <laughs> and that's sort of the sort of why she needs to, or why Aegon needs to, be because the fact that they aren't able to work together well enough to stop them is an indication that they couldn't work well enough together to stop an even bigger threat. Yeah. Now with Dorne, that's certainly an interesting point, and with the North as well, because these are the kingdoms on the extremities. They're the ones that have the most ability to sit back and wait and see what happens. If Aegon starts to do well. They can be like, oh, yeah, we'll surrender to you now without having expended anything. Just waiting to see how it goes. Dorn and the North both have that uh, option. Luxury. And that seems to be sort of what happened. Let's let's look in the North, though, to see uh, focus on there for a minute. Can you read this? Oh, I can read it. I just I just was waiting for Aziz to say, quote, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, before oh. I was, yeah. <laughs> Even in the North, King Storin... Even in the north, King Torin Stark of Winterfell sat with his lord's bannermen and counselors late into the night, discussing what was to be done about this would-be conqueror. The whole realm waited anxiously to see where Aegon would move next. Within days of his coronation, Aegon's armies were on the march again. Mm -hmm. So only days, so he moved pretty quickly there. He defeats the local lords... Gets Maidenpool, Duskendale, all those, all those places we named, sort of sorts out the crown lands, and then apparently has his coronation. Within days of that, he's on the march again. So probably in those in that short time, they were probably organizing the armies into groups. They were deciding where they would go. They, they probably had decided there would be three thrusts at first, which we'll get to in a minute, and a certain amount of troops left behind to defend the new Aegon fort and to see to logistics like sending food out to the armies and gathering taxes to pay for everything. There must have been a lot of other conversations. As it says here, the whole realm waited anxiously. They didn't just wait. They talked about it, I'm sure. And that would have been happening in tavern to the largest long haul and fanciest, you know, rooms. <laughs> I can't think of a good word. So just rooms around the, the kingdom. Imagine the, uh, the puppet shows. We've always seen that as a way to sort of gauge the, the common folks' attitude towards the nobility in a certain time. Like, what sort of things, what sort of scandals are they mocking? Which royals and lords are they praising or making fun of or gossiping about? What have you. The puppet shows would have a lot of material to work with <laughs> in, a, in a time like <laughs> this. They might actually be able to make fun of Heron because they could, you know, they could get away with that. I'm sure the farther south you go, the more you can make fun of Heron. Jesters, too, could mock their lords for not for being afraid of the dragons or whatever. You know, these different fools and they're allowed to make fun of powerful people. They would have a lot of that going on. It makes me wonder about the spy game in general in this era in, in, in the conquest. Like. It feels like more of the spy game came when Westeros was at peace. Spy There's more spying in times of peace in some ways because the things you're spying on are different. Like you're trying to learn secrets about your people who are ostensibly your allies. It's different when you're spying on people for pure military reasons, like trying to learn, like, where do they keep their money and where do they who has the keys to the safe or, you know, where does the general sleep and things like that. It's different than. Like who's sleeping with who, or there's just different things you would be spying on depending on whether it's peace or wartime. And with the lack of trust between so many kingdoms, it might you might not just have like ambassadors and people there that are just playing a double game of also a diplomat who's also a spy, which is a fairly common thing. And so I just wonder how it was played out. Like what's the basis? What's the the framework of spying in this era and intelligence games in general? I don't have a strong handle on it. I'd love to hear some ideas from y'all or theories or just general thoughts because, yeah, I don't know. There, there's Who was the little finger of this era, if anyone? And what does a little finger in this era do, given there isn't a central power structure to try to climb? Do you attach yourself to whoever you think is the strongest and just hope you've chosen well and do everything you can to make sure that that actually works out and then 
once you've ascended, then you start manipulating from within? Or when does it start? When do you start turning on? You know, when do you start working for yourself? And yeah, it's a big question. My, my supposition is that Aegon probably did the most spying in this, Maybe. this little Maybe. moment. Because it's not much reason for the North to be spying on Dorne. It's not much reason for Dorne to be spying on the Iron Islands. But Aegon needs to know about all of them. He's going to conquer the whole continent. And he needs also... He's got dragons that can fly around and see where <laughs> the troop bases are, yeah. see where the bridge crossings are, see what, et cetera, et cetera. So he has more motivation and more ability to do it. And uh, I, I, it makes sense to me that other spies that would have been operating were probably more locally, right? They would have been like within a city or two cities or maybe even their, a, a neighboring uh, kingdom. But they're not spying all around the continent where I think Aegon would have been. Is this perhaps against his attitude of straightforward dominance? Like if he's, if people whisper that he's got spies and doing this other stuff, would they, would that undermine his, you know, front facing strength? Would they look at him as someone that won his kingdom any, by cunning rather than. If he's any good at spying, they don't know he has the spies. <laughs> So, right. Yeah. Well like, said. Very yeah. well said. <laughs> so maybe he just can't do it too much. He can't. Yeah, he can't be. Hmm. Maybe a little bit of a balance to strike there. Yeah, like if you do it effectively, then yeah, it's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and and again, I think uh, we've said a couple times it sort of the. It looks like he has this, you know, straightforward, assertive, I'm more powerful, uh, tactic. But I think that comes from the moment he chose to make his play. Mm, I think there okay. was a lot of planning and logistic and spying leading up to that that enabled him to use this tactic. If he had done it at a different time or in a different order, it wouldn't have played out as well. So I think that it's it's maybe I, not. I, I think there is some spying behind it for sure. Okay, yeah, more of the spying of like, is the timing right? Is you know, are the, is everybody distracted properly? What's their attitudes? Like, what will they do? Like, getting a right. read on these leaders and their personalities to understand how they will react, rather than like snooping on their planning sessions and hearing what they say. So yeah, I can see that. That works pretty well, and it could be the snooping stuff as well. I just I think that's a little bit less likely, but certainly not something we can discard, not remotely. So he did something that's a little unusual that you wouldn't necessarily see a lot of generals do, which is split your army into three, especially when you are already kind of small. Like you normally you would think strength in numbers, you know, three dragons together. Like who's going to possibly stop that? On the other hand, who's going to stop one dragon in this era? Until they started getting an understanding of how to stop dragons, which they never really did during the conquest. The Dornish maybe did, but that was, we'll call that separate. Uh, hit them as hard as you can before they figure out what few options they even have before they start putting scorpions on every castle wall take as many castles as you can you know before they get to that point where they're like okay now we at least have something that might stop a dragon at this point they might not have anything at all their chance of victory is like zero percent or killing a dragon is perhaps zero percent you could still maybe get a lucky arrow and kill a rider but that's a pretty thin hope to rest everything on. So you can both see why it's a little unusual in terms of standard military planning. Not necessarily that unusual, but it's not what you would usually see. So, but it also maybe keeps them safer in some ways. It doesn't put all your eggs, your eggons in one basket. Also, if he's choosing targets well, if he's choosing battles he knows that he can win, you get more troops flipped to your side more quickly, mm. right? And you also have this momentum that other people can't ignore. And, you know, it, it is, it, there are some risks to it, but I think the reward far outweighs the risks in this scenario. Okay, yeah. And I think you could pretty reasonably plan for what would happen. I don't know if he knew, he could probably have predicted that Heron would haul himself up in his big castle that he just spent 40 years building and that he's really proud of. Like, that's not some genius insight. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the the reach and the westerlands bringing out all their big ass armies that's also fairly predictable they have huge amounts of manpower they'll probably expecting each kingdom to rely on their strength is again that's not some genius insight they just kind of expected them to do the thing that they're best at and they knew that that Aegon and his sisters knew that wouldn't be enough to beat them they're like yeah they're gonna do what they do best 
and their what their their best is not good enough. So there you go. Nina also writes interestingly that the trust, the level of trust here between Aegon and his sister wives, he could send them out, and I don't just mean, and she doesn't just mean trust like are they going to turn on me and be traitors? But that is a little bit of a part of it. Mostly it's just like, are they capable enough to do this? Right. You <laughs> trust their competence. Yes. Yeah. And the answer is clearly and, uh, yes. There's, there seems to be zero doubt. Like he had, it seems like he had ultimate confidence in them and presumably vice versa. That was something we talked about earlier too. The idea that this is a, a perfect storm of things had to come together for Aegon to make this conquest. You right. The, there may have been some Targaryen with dragons in the past with this ambition, but he didn't have two other dragon riders. It, even if he did have, or she had two other dragon riders didn't necessarily trust them to not turn on them or to manage it properly or not just burn everything down. Or you know, they, they had, they had to have this, this big foe that people would be happy to get beaten in Heron had to have, trusted people close to you with dragons to make the move and to have a certain ambition. Maybe you also have to have the, the dream to give you motivation on and on. So you might, cause you might have, you know, uh, some powerful faction of Lords might be like, Hey, Rainey, so your second fiddle here. Maybe we will put, make you queen over your brother and other sister. And that may have been, I don't think that was a motivation for Aegon to marry Rainey's as well as Visenya, but it might've been an added bonus that it, helps keep them even more as a unit rather than creates the possibility of another branch forming a branch that I didn't even think of the idea go to war with him which might've... ended up happening anyway <laughs> rainy season <and> Visenya's <laughs> lines both went against each other anyway so I, I didn't consider too that it might have been another thing he was thinking ahead that there are going to be some lords that offer marriages to them no I'm marrying them yes you, you, we're not having an alliance or marriage we're having an alliance or submission Yes. Don't even ask for my sister's hand. What an oops that would be like. He's got Visenya, he's his wife, they got the two big dragons, and then all of a sudden Meraxes go he Rainies and Meraxes marries, I don't know, the Lord of Castle Rock, and they start like like in House of the Dragon, where they start building another dragon pit over there. All of a sudden the land is yeah. starting to get golden haired, <laughs> green eyed Targaryens popping out. And it's like, Well, we really screwed that up, didn't we? He's like, I really should have <laughs> married my sister. <laughs> you know, my other sister too, you know. <laughs> But yeah, you could totally see that coming. Like, of course, we hear that Aegon was just like really into Rainey's too. So that that's probably even more important than anything else. But it doesn't have to be just one reason. He could have been like, well, this is why I'm going to marry you and not just have, you know, maybe he would have just kept her as a lover or something. I don't know. Who knows what the go back and forth between them on a personal level and how that went, especially with Visenya in the mix. And that's a thing too. Like if Rainey's is and Aegon are the ones who are actually like really close in terms of intimacy. Apparently Visenya didn't have a big problem with that, or if it wasn't that big of a problem for her, because that might've been an issue of like loyalty as well, maybe, but apparently nothing ever seems to happen with that. So except for her, you know, being willing to slice his face open to prove a point. So <laughs> maybe there's a little, <laughs> a little of that anger in there <laughs> that came out in that moment. <laughs> By the way, you asked kind of rhetorically, like who knows what went on between them? Like, Ori's might know. The Mace of Dragonstone might That's know. That's a good point. George knows. Come on, George, right. tell us. Some people know. Some servants that they yeah. kind of get ignored might have might have heard some things. So here's the next quote that tells us what the three uh, groups of armies were headed off to do. The greater part of his host crossed the Blackwater Rush, making south for Storm's End under the command of Ori's Baratheon. Queen Rhaenys accompanied him astride Meraxes of the Golden Eyes and Silver Scales. The Targaryen fleet, under Daemon Velaryon, left Blackwater Bay and turned north for Goldtown and the Vale. With them went Queen Visenya and Vagar. The king himself marched northwest to the God's Eye and Harrenhal, the gargantuan fortress that was the pride and obsession of King Heron the Black. All three of the Targaryen thrusts faced fierce opposition. We'll focus on each of the thrusts individually, starting with Aegon's for a couple of reasons. It's the way we've been framing this. It makes sense for all we've set up is talk about him going to knock off the biggest bully first. So we don't actually know which of these things happened first, but I do think it probably did happen first because it was the closest target. 
Aegon, you know, Harrenhal's closer to King's Landing or the site that becomes King's Landing than Storm's End is. Certainly closer than the Vale. So the Vale, I can feel pretty confidently the Vale was the last of these. But what order we do them in doesn't necessarily matter that much. Either way, we're going to do Aegon first. But for a couple of other things first, though. Meraxes just sounds so stunning as a dragon. Golden eyes and silver scales. Like, the Black Dread says a lot, but it, it's not... It's the size and menacing features, not the coloration. I mean, maybe being pitch black makes it a little more menacing. But golden eyes and silver scales, that just sounds beautiful. Just like wondrously amazing. A little bit like Sunfire, perhaps. Sunfire considered the, the most beautiful dragon of, of the dance era. Well, I feel like Meraxes was probably the most beautiful of this era. It just sounds like it. Just wow, right? And Nina points out as well something I think we've pointed out before. It's more of a theoretical thing that's now come true. We always wondered if Vagar's color would create a pairing. Danny's dragons with Aegon's dragons. When Vagar's color was finally revealed, indeed, it did create a loose pairing. It's not a 100% overlap, but it's very close. We got Drogon and Balerion, black. Drogon is black and red. I'm not sure Balerion is red, has any of the red, but whatever. Mostly black. That's pretty similar. It's extremely similar. Viserion is like goldish, creamish, silver, like a light pale kind of color. So it's metallic-ish, which is similar-ish to the silver. And then we've got a Vagar, who's more of a pale green, and Rhaegal, who's darker green with bronze color. So there's the green the metallic-y, lightish color, and the black. So they're, they're, like I said, not exactly one-to-one, but pretty close and probably on purpose. It's hard to imagine that that was just a coincidence by George, the three dragons being so similar like that. So what does that actually mean in terms of this parallel? Well, I guess it, apart from deepening the Danny Aegon parallels, well, what does it mean specifically? Well, I don't know. We'll have to see. Does it, ha- does it say anything about who the eventual riders will be? Does their name say anything about that? Like Rhaegal versus Rhaegar and Rhaego and... Yeah, I don't know. But great fertile ground for theorizing is something the fandom has wondered about a lot. But interestingly, you've only had that confirmation for a little while now that Rhaegar is green to really be sure that this this was even possible. Because if George had been like, actually, Rhaegar is blue or red or something like that, we'd be like, well, that's that's just right out then. (laughs) That doesn't fit at all. But he left it just close enough that you can make that comparison. All right, let's do take a few questions and and uh, do our mid roll business, and then get back to it. Uh, Lady Ray, with a follow up from your intro there, Sean. Let's start with that. She says, "My point was more about the maesters as a whole, and less about a singular maester. The Citadel has very strong opinions about what is worth paying attention to, and surely do not listen to just anyone who is a maester. So, when did a truly cohesive narrative begin, corroborated by many, many learned ne- men?" When did it become worthy history and not a footnote? Okay, yeah, I like that framing of the question. The The first take Sean had was a good thing point to make and discuss, but this getting a little drilled in and more specific also makes a lot of sense. Like, would the ma- would the archmaesters even believe what this maester was telling them? Is part of ma- mm-hmm. one thing she's suggesting. Yeah. The other thing is, well, if we have several maesters over a century at Dragonstone, eventually the point would be like, well, this, this, this maester said the same thing as the last maester and the same as the last maester. Or do they end up being sent to the wall like Eamon for getting a little too, <laughs> <laughs> getting a little too mystical and magical about it. A lot depends on who is in charge. Like it's academia in a sense, but it's way more powerful than academia. And anyone who's experienced academia knows like, well, just like any business or corporation or industry or group of any kind, there's like a, internal culture that determines a lot of what they like and don't like and that culture at this point for us to determine what the maesters were like is pretty hard for us to guess at we can kind of assume it's been similar to how it's always been but their attitudes towards dragons are always a common feature of our discussing of them and this is maybe before they had established a lot of those attitudes because they hadn't seen the destructive power of dragons unleashed on the continent something that became a problem they're like well look at all the times the dragons went to war like the dance was we gotta not let that happen again it was so destructive they may not have been thinking this way back at this time they didn't know about all that destruction or they had only read about it it would have been in books they had read about the valyrian wars and some of them some few might have been like this is serious like 
I've read about what dragons can do, and I have every reason to believe these sources. And it, to them, it isn't just a book. It's like, no, this could really happen. They might be in the minority, though. The other ones are more focused on, like, what's in front of them and things that are more clear and present dangers or crops and winter and, and things that are still really important and are, are worried about the, what this war would do to the, the continent and less about the, specifically the dragons. Eventually, they might be like, oh, it's not just this war ravaging the country. These dragons are ravaging the country. They're the worst part of it. I don't know what their attitudes are. I'm just saying there's a lot of possibilities and we can't. We have to start fresh rather than going back to the old, oh, the maesters want to kill the dragons. Like this is this is before that, maybe. <laughs> One thing we can maybe suppose, we talked about the idea that Aegon just showed up and said, I'm king now. So you have all these, these lords, these kings who've been there for thousands of years, like, oh, sure, dude, who are you, <laughs> right? And you can imagine that, the gardeners and the high towers probably had a similar opinion and they probably had a lot of influence over the citadel the maester at castle rock probably would have been in sync with the lannister in charge you know mm, they, yes. if the, the kings around the realm are kind of blowing them off the maesters may have also they might have taken more effort to write stuff down than the lord would have but they still might not have had the same sort of like <gasps> everything's changed now until that, that first battle and people get burned up or whatever, it, it might have, until, until some real action started, it might have, they might not have really been paying enough attention and recording it properly, giving it the proper credence. And or Aegon might have been keeping it on wraps too. He might have been keeping the maesters from knowing what his plans were. So. Right on. Well, well said. And thanks for the clarification, Lady Ray. Very insightful comments there. Dornish Dame says, I wonder if Aegon got Oris to spy for him. He was obviously trusted and was black haired. So his lack of dragon and Valyrian looks would have enabled him to blend in better than Aegon and his sisters. Hmm, interesting. He wouldn't have necessarily been famous. Yeah, or his most likely wouldn't have met wouldn't have met with High Lords. But I think we see in Davos two in the Dance of Dragons how much info can be learned just by blending in with the small folk and listening to gossip. That's a great point. Davos two is in a tavern there, at uh, at the at White Harbor, and yeah, he does learn a lot. He's also at a tavern in uh, the Sisters. The three sisters. So uh, that's a great point. Yeah, Orius is. A, there's other perhaps members of his court that don't look necessarily look Valyrian. We're not sure who had the Valyrian look and who didn't amongst some of these other like the House Coheris. I kind of assume they did, but that's not a sure thing. They might have had some marriages to other families that started producing some non Valyrian looking children. I mean. Everybody acknowledges how different the story would be if Jon Snow looked like his father, <laughs> assuming it's regular. <laughs> like, oops, can't hide that kid. You're gonna have to, you have to get a little more creative than that, Ned. You can't just say, "Oh, that's my kid." No, that's not gonna fly, bro. bro. <laughs> we discuss. I like yeah. to. I just want to say real quick. I like to imagine the idea that uh, the Aegon took Ori's in the middle of the night on Valerian, dropped him off at Lannisport, and an Ori's goes into Lannisport and hangs out in the taverns to get information while Aegon goes to Hightower or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And then picks Ori's back up in the middle of the night. All right, what'd you find out? <laughs> that sounds Compare cool. notes. Yeah, I wonder if Ori's has ever ridden on a dragon. We know that there are cases where someone, you know, a dragon had a second person riding with them. We see it in Jaehaerys' time. Uh, if any dragon could have a second uh, second person on their back, it's Balerion. I mean, if Vermithor could do it <laughs> and, and Quicksilver could do it, or Silverwing, then yeah, no problem for Balerion. Uh Next question comes from Knight of Peaches on our Discord. Would Balerion have been murdered back in Old Valyria? This references our discussion that Balerion was unusually large. And as a way to, is it possible that we know that there was lots of assassinations between the great houses of Valyria. That's a thing. In fact, it's one of the theories for why the doom happened was that enough of the house sorcerers were killed that they were unable to hold back the, the force of the geothermal vents that they had been holding back with sorcery for so long. All that finally came to a head with one gigantic explosion it goes to show just how much pressure was being held back. If that large of an explosion happened. So it certainly fits that if you have, assassination of sorcerers of lords of dragon riders why not assassinate a dragon as well if it's looking like it's going to be a particularly large dominant dragon you could see you don't want that as another house you don't want that house to gain the benefit of 
what that large dragon would do for you, and so you kill it when it's young. Probably a lot of ways to do that. Bribe a dragon keeper. I don't know. There's who knows what the kinds of weird sorceries and techniques they used back in old Valyria, but it, it, it's probably doable. Uh, I like the idea a lot as, a, as like a world building point to make for Valyria. Whether true or not, I could see it fitting very well. I, in my mind, when you ask, why not assassinate a dragon? I'm like, well, sure, you go ahead and do it. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about a hatchling here, but even yeah, even a hatchling might be a little nice. scary. Still, <laughs> yeah, it still might be too much. Like, nah, I'm not. I don't want to mess with a baby tiger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to with, mess with a baby Komodo dragon. Yeah, those things, yeah. no thank you. If you would like to support the show, if you're enjoying our coverage of Fire and Blood or enjoying our back catalog or just enjoying yourself as a fan of History of Westeros, why not sign up to become a supporter? You can enjoy our episodes without ads. You can listen to us on Patreon. There's now a, a secondary feed spun off on Spotify. So if you have Spotify and you're a patron, you can get access to this feed rather than going to Patreon. You can listen to it on Spotify. It's an exact copy of the Patreon RSS feed. So it might be more convenient for you to listen on Spotify, which has a better player than Patreon, which is, you know, Patreon covers all sorts of creators, artists, podcasters, musicians. Spotify is actually focused on listening. So there, it makes sense that their player is a little bit stronger. So this might be a nice benefit for a lot of y'all. If you're curious how to make that work, Email us at westroshistory at gmail.com or send us an email through your Patreon mail and we'll get you situated. It's a new feature, so we're just getting our feet wet with it, but it should be should be pretty nice having a Patreon Spotify integration. It should make some of y'all's lives a little smoother, a little easier to listen to the feed ad-free. And yeah, that's a pretty nice benefit, we think. But of course, there's also the bonus episodes you can get by signing up. Those are probably a little easier to find on the Spotify feed as well. But either way, you can always ask us questions. If you're a patron or not, and you don't know how it all works, just reach out. We'll take care of you. If you want to sign up, it's patreon.com slash history of Westeros. And you can also sign up, but you can also go to our website. There's other ways to support the show other than Patreon if you prefer to do that. We've got a lot of options there. Go buy a shirt. You could go buy a shirt. That is true. That's right. Uh, that is history. That is historyofwesteros.threadless.com. And I know Ashea has got a new idea for a shirt to put up there pretty soon. Uh, so we'll have, we'll keep that under wraps until it's ready. But she got a, had a cool idea for a custom shirt. And I'm excited to be able to describe that to y'all when the time is right. It's not quite there yet, though. I like the just the, the, the black shirt with the red and white History of Westeros with the, the Weirwood branch. I really like that. Yeah, that one's cool. I, yeah, I do like that one too because the the werewolves look cool on black. <laughs> it just it looks yeah. so creepy and dark and neat. Yeah, it does look good. All right, let's talk about speaking of black. We'll talk about hair in the black. Let's review why he's so unpopular. His his family prior to him, like we we've gone over why he was so unpopular. He was a tyrant and all that. But it isn't just him; it's his family. His father tried and failed to expand the to at most of his attempts to expand the kingdom. There was a few things he was successful at, but mostly he led a bunch of failed attacks against places that you could guess were bad ideas. Like, he tried to attack the Vale a few times, like the Bloody Gate. There's a reason it's called the Bloody Gate. What makes you so special that you could overcome these enormous geographical constraints? Well, nothing. In fact, nothing makes you that special. Uh, Halleck was his name, Halleck Hor. And possible Dune reference there, naming that guy Halleck, uh, as in Gurney Halleck, but George is a fan of Dune. Speaking of Dune, Halleck was Heron's father. Yes. Is that right? Okay. Speaking of Dune, we uh, I am doing a live stream with Alt Shift X, Dune versus A Song of Ice and Fire. Lots of parallels. That's coming up. Uh, should be Monday at eight thirty. Uh, we may be changing that now because the Dune movie's been pushed out. It was it's been delayed mm -hmm. for five months, so we might change our schedule. So TBD uh, on that one but we'll make sure everybody knows about it when it's happening. It should be a lot of fun. We're both very big fans of Dune and A Song of Ice and Fire and noted a lot of parallels there. So yeah, Halleck was Heron's father. Halleck's father was named Harwin Hardhand. Harwin Hardhand is like a George's version of Harold Hardrada from the, the Viking king who was also a 
Byzantine guard and did all this. His life is really interesting and lots of stories have been written about him. So it's no wonder George used that as inspiration for Harwin Hardhand. Has Daniel, Daniel, Daniele Bellelli done an episode on him? I think he's mentioned him, but I don't think he's mentioned him specifically. Yeah, that would be good. That's History on Fire, y'all, if that reference went over your head. Good show uh, friend of ours. Uh, We've collaborated with a number of times. So thraldom used in the area and in general. Obviously, this is a a big no-no for Westeros. So not only is he a tyrant, but he's breaking all these traditions. He follows a religion that isn't very popular, that's not well liked. It's one thing to follow the old gods. People kind of respect the old gods, even if they don't worship them. The mainland doesn't really give a fig about the drowned god. They they kind of think of it the way Makoro probably does. The drowned god is some demon, you know? <laughs> he's like the, he's not a deity that needs to be placated. It's some evil being that lives under the sea that you should be wary of but not worship. That seems to be pretty similar to how a lot of Westeros views the drowned god, I think. Maybe not quite that uh, specific and not something you maybe would say to a group of ironborn to their faces unless you have an army behind you. But, yeah, definitely one of many things that makes him unpopular. The the Drowned God's chosen people, plus there, it's kind of like, um, you know, some religions have this as part of their dogma, that they're the one true religion, that the followers of this religion are going to inherit the earth. There's a few real world religions like that, where they're, it's, it's, framed that way or marketed that way if you want to get a little more cynical or realistic depending on how you want to see it if you see maybe you're cynical enough to see that as realistic um and well with that in mind the drowned god's religion is one of those that is one of those religions that says that you know the meek shall inherit the earth but erase meek and say followers of the drowned god shall inherit the earth so they believe it's their duty to conquer the world their religious duty now not everyone follows that religion that closely but a leader who's conquest oriented loves to have that on his side like my people want to do this because it's their religion so all he's got to do is kind of co-opt that and sort of guide that energy in the right direction and you've got a big old kingdom i mean it's the biggest it's it's bigger than the reach at this point in, in history this kingdom i think it's close we'll say it's not more populous though uh, the fact that it's clo- even close to the size of the Reach, if not larger, is just maybe is a point you hadn't realized, which just points out just how large this this kingdom is. Uh, and basically everyone, so everyone's basically a slave. Like you're you've been conquered by a people whose belief system says this is right. We deserve to conquer you and rule you. So they're not going to treat you well. <laughs> they think they're superior based on their religion. It's a deeply held belief that they're superior to you. And that they're allowed to enslave you. Enthrall you is the right word. Yeah. So it's pretty pretty darn bad. Heron Hall took 40 years <laughs> to build. And so he's all this time, he's ruining the Riverlands, you know, dr- bleeding it dry. Nina says, I wonder if George was partly inspired by the old myth of slaves constructing the Egyptian pyramids. You know, the biblical stories there. Uh, that's not actually true. There's, they are notice nina said myth there that it's not accurate but it is a popular misconception which there's nothing wrong with drawing on popular misconceptions to put in your stories it's fiction in the first place what's wrong with drawing on it's just drawing on existing fiction drawing on existing world myth drawing on reality they're all inspirations they're all good sources for creating a, a realistic world around your fantasy setting uh, and it just fits really well. It fits in a fantasy setting to have virtually enslaved people laboring under these extremely harsh conditions to make this huge edifice. Valyria, Harrenhal, it's, these things are kind of the same, right? And it's kind of funny that, that Aegon of Valyrian is the one kind of setting these people free from that when his own people were... <laughs> <laughs> known for doing that for way longer than 40 years try 4,000 years is still too short for that it's longer than that even and, but not only was he offending the seven he was cutting down werewoods to make Aaron Hall. so he was pissing off the north too so this is this guy really just made enemies everywhere but he also wanted to conquer everyone Aegon also wanted to conquer everyone but he was a little nicer about it he didn't trample on their beliefs and traditions in fact he made a point to 
uphold their beliefs and traditions for the most part whenever possible. I want to maybe defend Aegon a little and say that it's not so much that he wanted to conquer everyone as that he wanted to unite the continent. Yeah. And to do that, maybe you need to conquer everyone. But Aegon didn't have some like, you know, altruistic ideal of establishing more peace across the land through organization or saving everyone from a prophecy of doom in the future. He was just violent and greedy, you know? Yeah. And if you factor in how he behaved afterwards, yeah, like he didn't try to codify things at all. He mostly just let the regions be different. And that started to become a problem over time, but his descendants had to deal with that. It wasn't a problem so much for him. <laughs> so the unification was more of a gradual thing, like, which makes sense. You can't force all this change all at once. One step at a time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Heron had just done the opposite of all this. He had just shat on everyone's beliefs, traditions, you know, made them suffer pretty easy to turn that against them i wonder you know his his another black here we have hair in the black we have bl the black dread we have the, the color black for the targaryens for their their house we talk about taking the black is another phrase that comes up in westeros the actual first mention of hair in the black in all of a song of ice and fire was on the wall a mention of his brother and how his brother when Aegon the conqueror came Heron's brother was Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, and he did nothing like a good Lord Commander of the Night's Watch is supposed to do. He didn't show any loyalty to his brother and just did the thing a Night's Watch Lord Commander is supposed to do. He ignored the troubles of the realm and focused north on what might be coming from there. A couple of points on that. Some of these will require us to expand on later. One of them is how ironic it is that Aegon's, the King's Peace, destroyed the Night's Watch. <laughs> Which is hmm. very ironic given that he is supposed to, supposedly, supposedly, <laughs> uh, trying to protect the entire realm from a future invasion by the others. So, hamstringing the Night's Watch and undermining their manpower is an odd way of going about that. But it's kind of uh, something he didn't exactly predict or manage properly. It was inadvertent. Yeah. He didn't. He didn't right, yeah. do it on purpose. Exactly. Well, I mean, why would he do that on purpose? It makes no sense. Yeah. <laughs> and so <laughs> I have to think that it's it's almost like, well, he didn't interfere, even when it was his brother. It's like, did Aaron, did Aaron's brother actually like him? Would he have interfered, even if it wasn't a taboo? Like, why was this guy on the wall? Like, was it because? It was the only way to keep his brother from killing him? Like, this is a guy that doesn't trust anyone, probably. Is he going to trust his own brother to not usurp him? It's probably one of the few places his brother could be safe in this world would be to take the black. <laughs> it's like, I've forsaken all claims, bro. Seriously, I'm no threat to you. <laughs> like, I'm on the wall now. Because, I mean, Aaron probably, like, Halleck may have killed one of his brothers to take over. And I think Heron killed one. I think Heron killed his older, may have killed one of his older brothers. It's, it's, it's not certain, <laughs> which it probably was exactly what happened. So if you're going to kill your own brother to take over that, you're probably the type that will be suspicious of your own brothers doing that to you. Like lot of people who are dishonest expect other people to be dishonest. Uh, you know, it's kind of one of those things. Like you are, you see people kind of through the filter of your own personality. So I'm not sure <laughs> Heron's brother would have given a crap about helping Heron in, in the first place. Like, no, hell no, I'm not helping him. Even if I could, I wouldn't have done it anyway. They're they're gonna give you're gonna praise me for this. I'll take the praise, but I really don't deserve <laughs> it. <laughs> Convenient praise to earn. Yeah, yeah. He's like, I'll take all your acclamations, but man, I would not have <laughs> done a thing. I would not have sent him one onion. <laughs> 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 he gets nothing. Not a not a single spearhead from me. Yeah. Now, remember, too, this isn't the first time we've had an outsider or a, a, a tyrant ruling over the Riverlands. Nina reminds us of House Teague when, back in their day, various Riverlords had risen up against King Humphrey Teague and welcomed Arik III, I'm sorry, Arlen III, rather, Durandon, to help him. He was going to come in and kick out Humphrey Teague 
Uh, but he didn't leave. He came in, kicked out the king they didn't want with their help, and then he's like, now I've got you. You helped me come in, and I'm not going to leave. And they fell for it again with, with Heron's grandfather, because Heron's grandfather kicked out the kicked out the Stormlanders and then also decided to stay and uh, betrayed the River Lords there. So, fool them twice. Shame on them. Although, to be fair, these were like 300 years apart. So, <laughs> still, fool them twice. Shame on them. Here is a, another quote that kind of summarizes a lot of what we've said into a nice, succinct point about the uh, attitude of the River Lords. Quote. Though House Horror, sorry, though House Horror had ruled the liver, <laughs> the <Sorry>. Liverlands, <laughs> the Liverlands. <laughs> though House Horror had ruled the Riverlands for three generations, the men of the Trident had no love for their ironborn overlords. Heron the Black had driven thousands to their deaths in the building of his great castle of Heron Hall, plundering the Riverlands for materials and beggaring the lords and small folk alike with his appetite for gold. Now, what did he do with all that gold? Was that just like? decorating his castle with it because there's one thing to just cut down the weirwoods because you need rafters for your castle but it sounds like he was also just making it as fancy as he could uh, evidence of which would have been destroyed by Balerion quickly thereafter which is maybe why we don't hear about it so much so again we have this parallel to maybe Aegon VI who's going to come into this realm when it's in chaos and be the the guy to settle it all down and kind of put people back on a path towards peace and stability again, only for maybe Danny to come in and maybe things would get thrown off again. Maybe the others throw that off first. I don't know what order these things are going to happen in, but you can see how it's a very strong parallel where you have unpopular Kings, whether it's Euron might be our best parallel for Heron, depending on what kind of in routes he makes, how, what kind of success he has. Cersei, not the most popular ruler ever. <laughs> And so there's a lot of unpopular people that could be cast as sort of a heronish type that the kingdom will be glad to be rid of. And that allows the savior figure, whether it's Aegon the Sixth, whether it's Danny, whether it's both of them in different arcs, kind of playing this role of using that uh, acclaim, using that leverage that everyone's giving them to vault themselves to greater heights of power once they've once they're the savior once they've proven themselves once they're the hero it's pretty easy to to, to utilize that to rise even higher to make yourself king or queen or what have you and stannis was sort of trying to do that it just didn't work out and now he's trying to do it again trying to be a savior for the realm he's like well i'm trying to save the kingdom to be the king you know I'm like yeah that is that is a good way to do it like there's other criticisms we could throw out there but that is a pretty good way to approach. It seems like honorable, like be the savior. Like if you really are right. the savior, instead of just casting yourself in that role, if you actually save the realm, you do deserve, I don't know, to be king necessarily, but you deserve a hero's status and everything that comes with that, which might mean being king. What what, what other criticisms are there of Stannis? <laughs> I'm too confused. <laughs> So before Aegon could actually face Heron, Heron, you know, had already just kind of let him take Duskendale and these other spots. Uh, here's where I'll describe why it makes almost makes sense for Heron to, to wait. I think if Heron's, unless Heron's a total dummy, he had to realize the political say, the situation. That is, if he calls his banners, they might not come. He doesn't want to look, he doesn't want to have that embarrassment. He doesn't want to look that weak. So make him come to me. Maybe something else goes wrong. Maybe he dies before then. Maybe he meets his end at my castle. This is where we're strongest. It's, it's kind of a power move of itself. He's like, I don't, I don't care about what you do on my borders. You know, f come face me, you know, and then we'll see what happens. And so it's kind of like responding to Aegon's boss attitude with a boss attitude of his own. It's like, let's settle this between us rather than, yeah, you took some, some of my lesser castles. Like, what does that mean? That's nothing. Like, this is the real showdown. It's going to come between us. But that said, he tried a few things uh, before Aegon got to Harrenhal. One major thing. And his goal may have been, well, by the time Aegon comes to me, well, he doesn't have a lot of men. Again, he's still not clear on the power of the dragon and exactly what it can do. So he's still thinking in terms of more conventional warfare, like, well, Aegon doesn't have a lot of soldiers. So if I can just, like, 
have a few smaller battles and whittle down his army? How is he going to besiege this gigantic castle I have if his army isn't large enough? Like, sieges are hard and long and slow, and he feels invulnerable to a siege because of the size of his castle and the size of his supplies and how much water he has stored and all this other stuff. So, which is, by the way, another reason not to call his entire force up if he's going to try to outlast Aegon through logistical tactics and not having as many frontal assaults and things like that. Let's try to whittle him down and wear him down. That's where there's maybe some intelligence behind all this. I'm not sure if that's what it was or if it may have just been pure pride and arrogance. It's easily could just be that. But I'm, I'd like to explore alternatives. Maybe this guy is just a complete dummy. It's probably a mix. Like, he probably is arrogant, but also he does have this big castle. Even if you're not arrogant, why did you build this big castle? Yeah. This is it. Yeah. This is what you built it for. And even if it, even with dragons, if it, if it was like Drogon and Rhaegar or whatever, they couldn't have burned Heron Hall down. It took Balerion. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So he, he was almost right. He just happened to not really truly understand Balerion. But aside from that, it, I think it was the right move. Yeah, yeah, and and facing Balerion in the field wouldn't have been better, you know. <laughs> right. No <laughs> yeah, way. Like, how's yeah. that better? Yeah. Like the if you the more troops you put in your army, the easier it is for the dragon to burn a lot of them at once. So, this is also a sign of intelligence. This next move we have here. Well, if you can't face a dragon on a battlefield, well, you got to use other means. And so, they're marching along the shore of the God's Eye towards Harrenhal. What happens? They get attacked. A night attack. It was called the Battle of the Reeds. It has nothing to do with Howland <laughs> and <laughs> Mira and Jojen. It's no, not some sort of internal Greywater Watch conflict. These are the actual reeds we're talking about. You know, those little things that stick out of the water in lakes and rivers. Uh, I get the impression that Balerion had nothing to do with this battle. It was a night attack on ships. They uh, apparently used muffled oars to get really close. And... This battle was repelled. So this first battle, there's two battles that we're going to describe here. Battle of the Reeds didn't go that well for the attackers. The Targaryens repelled them. Maybe Balerion saw them coming. I say he wasn't involved in the direct battle that we know of, but again, seeing them or, or maybe smelling them or something is possible. And I would understand a dragon not being able to join a battle in the Reeds. I, by the dragon, would not take my dragon into a swamp. <laughs> like that seems like a bad idea like one of the few things that can go wrong dragon's feet get stuck might actually be fatal like it might get l very stuck and not be able to get out probably not that bad but it would be in the not back of mention, my head not to mention if you've got boats sneaking up on other boats all right what does Blarian do now yeah. burn up the bad guys and the good guys all together yeah. Blarian can maybe give the warning because seeing them from above by flying but getting mixed up in it would have been difficult so it, it's the Targaryens are given by history the win in this battle, but we don't really know if there were a lot of casualties or maybe the Ironborn accomplished their goal, even though they were repelled. It may have been like a probing attack, see how they would respond, see what kind of defenses they would mount, like test their metal. The next battle was called the Battle of the Wailing Widows. This is the one where they definitely snuck up with muffled oars. We're not as clear on what happened in the Battle of the Reeds, but it was, it was almost certainly a night attack. So they snuck up with muffled oars. They came to shore, climbed out, and attacked the Targaryen camp. And this was a su successful surprise attack. That's why I'm guessing it was at night. If you're going to go fighting against a dragon, do it at night, right? Like, dragon can't see you. Again, the problem of friendly fire comes up. Like, we saw it at... We got a little tease of a dragon battle at night with uh, episode three of House of the Dragon, where Damon's just kind of clambering around on the beach, yelling for crab feeder to come out and fight him. Mm -hmm. They shoot flaming arrows at him when he's exposed. Stuff like that. Like, a lot of Caraxes' advantages were muted by it being dark. Same thing would be true for Balerion, maybe even more so, because Balerion's larger, less, more, maybe more cumbersome especially if it's by the shore we talk about swamps and reeds and uneven ground and yeah just a good smart place to attack from if you're the ironborn except for they didn't really think it through <laughs> yes the attack was successful but it was less successful than the counter attack <laughs> yeah because usually you could just run away from another army and they might have a hard time tracking you down 
but the dragon can track you down. <laughs> you can only go so far, so many places. The dragon can just spiral out till they see you. Yeah. So that's exactly what happened. I'm guessing tents were attacked, horses were scattered, supplies were destroyed. Maybe a little something like Ramsey and his twenty good men <laughs> getting amongst <laughs> Stannis' army, something like that. But a little, maybe a little more realistic version. Probably was more than twenty good men. Probably a lot more than twenty. I mean, bunch, a bunch of long ships were were unloaded. Two of Heron's sons led this attack, by the way. And I wonder if this was a conversation they had. Heron's like, no, we're going to let them come to us. We're going to hold up here and, and have a showdown here. And some of Heron's sons were like, yeah, but dad, we could hit them at night. We could ambush them. We're ironborn. This is, this is, we're good at this. We're raiders. We're a raiding culture. They're right by the water. It's a golden opportunity to hit them when they don't see it coming to use our strengths uh, at maximum uh, capacity here. It's what we're good at. But again, they didn't fully understand what they were reckoning with. So the attack was successful. A lot of Targaryens were killed, probably. Maybe as many as like a thousand. It was pretty bad. But a thousand is like a lot. That's like at this point, more it's than huge. 10% of their forces. Yes, right? yes. Because yeah. the majority it's literally of, decimated, right? <laughs> the major yes, the majority of the army was sent south with, with Oris and Rhaenys to fight at Storm's End. Or to fight the Stormlands, not just Storm's End. So, yeah, Aegon took a smaller army with him, which is yet more of a boss move. <laughs> it's like, no, I don't need that many, even though it's Heron Hall. It's like, I got Balerion, bro. That's, that's really all we need here. And, yeah, so they get away. The Ironborn get away. They get back to their muffled org ships and start sailing back home, which to them, that's it. They're free. They've, they've gotten away. That's been the truth throughout thousands of years of Ironborn raiding history. If they get back to their ships, that's it. They've won. No, not this time. At night, they're still safe. They're sailing back, but I guess Aegon knew it would take them more than one night to get home, which makes sense. The God's Eye is huge, and this was the southern side of it, so they would be sailing all night. When dawn arose, they were still sailing home, and visibility came, and Balerion was already up there looking for them. So when light came, Balerion easily spotted them on the lake, flew over, burned every ship, and that was that for two of Heron's sons we don't know how many sons heron had but he still had multiple left after he had at least two that survived uh, or didn't survive they weren't in the battle at all the two that were were killed and the remainder uh you know were presumably just holed up in heron hall one of these might have been his heir who his heir was is a little bit of a moot point since they're all gonna die but it would have mattered to heron at the time it would have maybe caused a little well you're the new heir now uh, whoever this unnamed son was. We know none of his son's names. <laughs> so, yeah, what are you going to do? Uh, the distance was their undoing. Had they attack, made this attack when Aegon and his army was a little closer to Harrenhal, they might have been able to do it all in one night before the sunlight comes and they would have gotten back to Harrenhal before Valerian could hunt them down. But they just clearly didn't plan for this. They just didn't even think of it. They didn't even conceive of this possibility, most likely. And, oof just shows their inexperience in dealing with dragons i just want to say real quick i'd rather learn some of the names of the mothers in the story than heron's sons <laughs> yeah <laughs> same same we don't yeah we don't know who heron's wife was maybe maybe he had multiple wives because like he's an ironborn king he probably had salt wives and a rock wife and i mean what would stop him you know Here's a nice little succinct quote to describe the action. I like how George writes it. Even though we've already described it, let's have this to, to put a dot on it. And oh. the victors at the Wailing Widow. And the victors at the Wailing Willows, returning across the lake to Harrenhal, were ill prepared when Balerion fell upon them out of the morning sky. Heron's longboats burned. So did Heron's sons. Well, the widows probably wailed too. Yeah, and that's what I was thinking. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of dudes were killed there, you know. So an entire squadron slash raiding party completely annihilated. Every single ship burned. No survivors, I'm guessing. Not one, it sounds like. So just extreme superiority over wooden. Like not, dra dragons have superiority over a lot of things, but there's really nothing they have more superiority over than wooden ships. <laughs> it's like such mm. an easy target. Especially when they don't have scorpions. Like when scorpions are are put on the deck of a ship, it's a lot more of a danger for the dragon. But this is uh, before they had figured that out, apparently. Also, Aegon. And no, go ahead. Put, putting a scorpion on your ship is probably not. 
ships are designed in a certain shape and size and weight to fit the soldiers and the cargo and for maneuverability. Just stick a scorpion there. It's probably not as easy to do as to say, right? These are long ships too, well. right? They probably, yeah, they might, yeah that's, they, those are not they might, for, they, for that. Right. It might not sail properly. It might not be weighted properly. It might not be easy to maneuver the scorpion. That's one of the problems with a, a, a ship is it's, it's just slow to turn. It's just uh, yeah. dragons are dragons are flying is a big difference, but compared to like someone on foot or even a horse, even a dragon still has to kind of can't like hover and turn on a dime like a helicopter. Ships would be even worse. So unless a scorpion can maneuver around, which on a little raiding long ship, I, I don't know, man. I, yeah. <laughs> it, it, bigger wooden ships that could handle maneuverable scorpions would also have big sails that are even more susceptible. The dragon could hot fly in hidden on and on and on. It's, it's, scorpions are not a magic answer to, to dragons. They may present more of a threat, but they're not just going to like, they don't even the battlefield at all. Well said. Now, next up, Aegon's use of time of day, his use of dusk and dawn and the time of day for his timing and to his advantage is something that we're going to see a couple times. And it occurs to me that I, when I was writing this episode in particular, I can't think of other examples of that. I can't think of it happening in the Dance of the Dragons maybe once or twice, but I can't think of a specific one. I'm going to keep an eye out for that. Aegon may have been a little bit smarter about his dragon tactics than a lot of other dragon riders. Maybe something he learned from the books or just something that occurred to him. But yeah, it's something that's going to come up when he actually attacks Aaron Hall too. The, the picking his time of day uh, as part of his strategy. I think it's very interesting. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I, I don't know of other times where that's even come up, but Egon uses, does it multiple times. So hmm, very good to know. Maybe something that Danny will figure out or yeah, I'd be very curious about that. Mm -hmm. Very curious about that. It's an important thing in the strategy of dragons is not just where to deploy them but what time of day yes yes so this had a big effect maybe the kind of thing that heron was trying to avoid mm, was his own people turning on him because he had to know that he wasn't popular he couldn't possibly be under any illusions about that i i don't think he was a complete idiot i think he was arrogant and foolish and Maybe naive about a lot of things, but a complete, but a, just a dunderhead. I don't know about that. That seems, that seems wrong. It is possible though. <laughs> it is possible that he was just this proud that he's like, well, they'll fight for me or else. Well, or else what? Or else you're going to punish them after you are incinerated? Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> so even though that battle was a loss, the Wailing Widows, Willows, ha ha, see, now I'm doing it too. The army that won that battle was destroyed, and it's not hard to see who came out ahead and all that. Even though there was a little back and forth, ultimately Aegon came out ahead of that. And that may have been the straw that broke the trout's back. Quote. <laughs> so now the Riverlands rose against him, led by Lord Edmund Tully of Riverrun. Summoned to the defense of Harrenhal, Tully, declared for House Targaryen instead, raised the dragon banner over his castle, and rode forth with his knights and archers to join his strength to Aegon's. His defiance gave heart to the other river lords. One by one, the lords of the Trident renounced Heron and declared for Aegon the Dragon. Blackwoods, Malisters, Vances, Brackens, Pipers, Freys, Strongs, summoning their levies, they descended on Heron Hall. So it, it seems that Heron may have gotten a little desperate or maybe decided he should call his banners after all. Or maybe he called just a few of them because it says he summoned Lord Tully. It doesn't necessarily say he summoned the others, but he might have. And it just isn't mentioned that way. But it's Tully who turned first. And that's huge. And apparently that, as it says, his defiance gave heart to the other river lords. They were already thinking it, but they were maybe afraid to be the first. Maybe they couldn't go over to Aegon so quickly but they were probably thinking it once the tide turned it turned in a in a hurry and it seemed to fall apart pretty quickly for Heron and his kingdom however it wasn't lost yet uh because how few men actually showed up is a little unusually small after the var various river lords had gathered you saw that list that's a list of very famous houses only 8000 men is what Aegon has outside Harrenhal. We know that because of the, the exchange they have. He's like, I have 8,000 men outside your walls. And he's like, you know, you're, what's outside my walls is no concern to me. I, my walls are tall and huge and super thick. 
Eight thousand is actually pretty small <laughs> for an encircling force. Of course, he never intended to encircle it. He intended to <laughs> use Balerion, but that is another thing that might have given given Heron a little bit of confidence. Like that's all. That's tiny. Like that's not enough for a lot of smaller castles. <laughs> you know, like it's definitely not enough to to for this castle. So he might have been thinking, yeah, what are they gonna do? A lot of them probably talk to each other, like messages going back and forth. Like, is it time to, should we raise our banners for Aegon? Is that what you're going to do? Like, yeah, we got to do that. It's time. Yeah, we got secret messages back and forth. You wonder if Heron has some spies, like, looking out for that sort of thing. Like, are they are they plotting against me? But I don't know if he had that sort of network, if he had informers to spy on his own people, or if he was too arrogant to do that sort of thing. He kept them in control via fear rather than spying on them. He may have done both. There's a lot we don't know about how Heron ran his kingdom. We just know he was a tyrant. So what, whatever it was, the people were glad to be done with it. I and mean, we do know that he's ravaged the lands, right? Yeah. He's just drained the resources, it, you know, probably human resources as well. There just might literally not have been as many people to send. Yeah, they I just agree. Have been gone through a generation too of probably being short on food, short on resources, short, you know, if the if all the strongest, healthiest men from each village were basically kidnapped and brought to build Heron Hall. Well, who's left in a village to farm and, and raise kids and et cetera, et cetera. So like it flash forward another generation. If someone calls the banners like, all right, we'll send you seven people, I guess. Yeah. You know, like you're right. Like the Riverlands had been in a war. First, they had a war a hundred years ago to overthrow the Storm Kings. Then they were ruled by Harwin Hardhand. He wasn't a great ruler, like not a very kind. And then the next guy, Halleck tried to, start all these wars that failed and these were mostly riverlanders that were brought to these wars and they so a lot of death there and then like you said two or three generate whatever 40 years is in westeros times two or three generations of thousands of captives dying to make this castle so you're right there'd be knights and people with money and means would still be around those guys aren't being forced to build the castle but the people the same people the same peasants that would be called up to fight in the levees would be these ones building river uh, building the castle so you're right there there would be a severe depletion of peasants and commoners and, and the people on the lower rungs of society because they're the ones that would have no way to get out of uh being conscripted for, for these yeah. workforces you know again basically slavery add to that even if they did have more people you can imagine all the reasons why they might not have been sent like there might have been like even if a you know, it's like layers of lords. You know, one lord is like, all right, call the banners, send your men. His four underlords might have been like, I don't know about this Aegon guy. We're not sending our soldiers. Not yet. Yeah. We, but we don't even have that many in the first place, you know. So. There'd be plenty of them that just want to sit back and see what happens, mm -hmm. uh, which is, we see that all the time when large scale conflicts break out, whether it's the War of Five Kings or something like this. People sometimes just sit on the sidelines for various reasons. They decide that's their best play. And Between Heron and a dragon, we don't want our people getting mixed up in this. Yeah, you know? yeah. And the ones that were willing to didn't have that many to send. So. Right, and again, we have this problem of, well, is the realm going to accept this guy long term? He doesn't even have a son. I mean, they might not have the confidence in dragons that, that Aegon and his men have learned having seen them in action. It goes both ways. If you're winning allies... And you don't know what a dragon can do. You might not be so quick to take that the side of the dragons because you're not. You don't actually know just how dominant they are. So that cuts both ways. Like Heron's not preparing properly because he doesn't know exactly what he's faced with. Well, the the people who are sitting on the fence, not sure who to fight for, they also don't know. So that's part of why Aegon does what he does later. But <laughs> to, to make an example of all this, uh, which really turns the tide even for farther. Something to consider here that's like a side note, House Malister. They're one of the houses mentioned there that the tide turned. I bet they were second or third to join Tully's. Like the whole point of the Malister's existence, they're Sea Guard. The point of they have that bell <laughs> that's only supposed to be rung when the Ironborn invade. Like their purpose of existence is to stop the Ironborn raids from the West. They're like the first line of defense against Ironborn raids. So it must really chafe being ruled by the ironborn they're like <laughs> we, this is like our whole thing and so they were like yes finally yes we're definitely glad to join the, anyone who's not ironborn and fight against them to free <laughs> ah this is terrible <laughs> yeah uh it would have been they would have been 
relieved to get out from under that black thumb of Heron. Side note, I'm guessing Quentin Coharis, the one who is the master at arms, uh, maybe he was too old to be fighting in the army at this point. This is the guy who gets Heron Hall as his seat later, so kind of feel like he was probably there. But if he wasn't there, his sons would have been, and, and maybe his grandson as well. So uh, if they were capable of fighting the army, he wasn't. But perhaps the whole batch, all the Coheri <laughs> were there. Now, it doesn't have to be, though. He doesn't have to be there. He doesn't have to be a frontliner. Just a, a guess that I think makes a lot of sense. Now, notably, they showed up at Hall to join Aegon. They didn't necessarily pay homage to him immediately. They knelt to him after Heron was defeated. So I wonder what kind of conversations happened first. They're, like, nominally on his side. They were with you to fight Heron. But you're not our king yet. So I kind of wonder about, like, the, the specifics of that. Like, w- how do they address him? You know, do they call him King Aegon? And he's, he's like, Lord Aegon. They're like, he's got some dude that's like King Aegon, you know. <laughs> Someone that's, like, correcting them. He's like, your grace, <laughs> you know, not my lord. <laughs> you know, some guy that's, like, sitting there. And Aegon's like, all right, chill, dude. We'll we'll get to that later. Or, or he's like, yes, I am King Aegon. You will address me. as like, I wonder which it was. I kind of feel like it might be the latter because he's such a such a boss. I I think the former. Uh, my idea is that you'll see. Just he's, wait. He's playing policy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. I don't I don't need to be pushy about it now. They'll all they'll all kneel once they see what Balerion does. Yeah, and, that's a good point. He, he knew because he he probably knew what he was about to do. He's like, I'm gonna burn this whole castle, and they're gonna see now that they're here. I w- I'm, they're gonna see. He might have been waiting for that. He's like, I want to make sure there's lots of witnesses to this. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And he did. Yeah. He and he wants to keep them friendly in the meantime and. It, I think there's a lot of reasons for like, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Yeah. I think they can all just coexist there for a moment. And Aegon just knows at the end of this, that they'll all be happy to kneel to him. Yeah. There's no reason for him to talk down to them. That's just, uh, yeah. it doesn't serve a purpose. Like he, we don't know that he actually had a giant ego that he needed to feel that way. He, he, he needed to be in charge, but he didn't need to like have his, you know, his uh, ego stroked, <laughs> you know, I don't think he doesn't seem like that kind of guy. He's like, no, I'm in charge and I know I'm in charge. And soon you will too. That kind of, I, I feel like that's, yeah. that's like, yeah. that's true confidence rather than projected yeah. confidence. If you need to tell someone you're the king, you're not really. Yeah, the there you go. I'll show you. Just wait. Just yeah, wait. <laughs> you're like, yeah, they can call me what they want right now, but it won't be long before they're like rushing yeah. to kneel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed they did. So, yeah, that's that's a good point. So, yeah, I kind of I think I see it that way, too, Sean. And the rest of y'all, I, I would love to hear your takes on this whenever we're going through this. This particular reread, especially, we're really trying to get into the, the, the tiny details on some of these things, trying to like insert ourselves into these characters' minds. So it's really, really open to interpretation, which that's, I always love to hear from y'all. Love to hear your opinions, your takes, your theories. But here, I feel like there's even more room for it because this is just, we're just talking about like people's personalities. This isn't something that. And like we are, I think we're all on fairly even footing here, as long as we like we have basic understanding of what this person did. But Aegon's personality is very hidden from us. Like he, it's another factor that goes into speaking uh, his his the way he comes off, even as a mystery to the Maesters. It fits in with that conversation we were having before that that Lady Ray brought up, that you brought up. That uh, maybe that's part of why he's an enigma to the Maesters too, is that he he did keep himself a bit of a secret. He didn't like let the Maesters record a lot of what he was doing. That it, it's it is possible, but maybe for other uh, alternate reasons or for additional reasons like this, that he just was like that. He kept he kept his own counsel. He didn't want people making guesses about who he was, or maybe he thought it was better to seem a little bit of mysterious. Like that projects more power, you know, having his having it be about the office and not about the man, you know? And and also, I don't know how to say this, uh, he wants to control the narrative. Okay, like, yeah. There might be times, like in modern times, you might have like, no press, no press for this. But once the meeting is done and a decision is made, okay, let's have a press conference, right? Okay. And that's like, the coronation is sort of like, all right, get all the maesters, let, let's get witnesses, to, but... But when he's doing the battle plans or meeting with the new allies, maybe he doesn't want that interaction to be recorded for posterity, you know. So what of the commoners at this time? The commoners, we hear, they cheered loudly and happily when Aegon had his first coronation on the Blackwater. 
after those few dozen lords surrendered, dozen lords surrendered early on. What about these commoners? What are the commoners in the Riverlands thinking? Were they like, here comes our savior? Were they a little wary? Oh, this is just another different crappy guy to have. Like, who cares who our king is? It's going to be terrible regardless. Was there optimism because of how terrible Heron was? I'm guessing there probably was because, yes, things could get worse, but man, they were bad. So they're probably going to get better under this guy, <laughs> especially if they even believed half of what he was saying. Yeah, even if they were wary of Aegon, they probably, there was still probably some optimism. So I feel like there were probably some that like kind of happily marched alongside him that just joined his army. They were like, yeah, like I want to be part of this, this thing. I want to be maybe the king, this new king will reward me for being in his army. They might see it as an opportunity. Uh, small scale ambition could be very stoked by all of this potential, like a new king, a new, uh, new rulership over the Riverlands. It's a lot of chaos chaos is a ladder you know that's one of those po possibly the most quotable show line that's relevant you know <laughs> and because it, it is pretty true and it's a good succinct way to put that so there might be yeah there's a lot of opportunities from small scale to high scale from high lords and ladies seizing on opportunities to become counselors or close to Aegon or close to his sisters in this new regime that's true on a smaller scale too there's like New tax collectors are going to get hired. New offices are going to be formed. There's all sorts of like, think about local government. Think about your local city council or your state senate rather than the, the federal senate. Or, you know, if you don't live in the U.S., whatever form of government you have. Yeah. There's a lot of possibilities there. And, yeah, they're all, they're all pretty strong. So, uh, I really like to think about that. It's a strong part of the world building that we don't, get much talk about it's not the maesters don't tend to spend a lot of time on this sort of thing they don't know a lot about it they're they spend most of their time inside the castles they're not out in the farms and fields talking to peasants not very often or not very many of them i'm sure there's exceptions i would love to hear those stories <laughs> okay let's talk well, well we're gonna have just the beginning of egg on arriving in heron hall and then we'll leave it there and get the first thing we'll do next time is discuss the parley between Aegon and Heron, and that's pretty cool because that's a that's a great place to start. Start with the conversation. One of the few recorded times that Aegon's dialogue is is specifically recorded for us. So let's start with the quote as we uh, finish up today of Heron Hall. Suddenly outnumbered, King Heron the Black took refuge in his supposedly impregnable stronghold. The largest castle ever raised in Westeros, Harrenhal boasted five gargantuan towers, an, in an inexhaustible source of fresh water, huge subterranean vaults well stocked with provisions, and massive walls of black stone higher than any ladder and too thick to be broken by any ram or shattered by a trebuchet. Heron barred his gates and settled down with his remaining sons and supporters to withstand a siege. Aegon of Dragonstone was of a different mind. Yeah, he expected a siege, but Aegon was like, I'm not doing a siege. What are you talking about? I've only got 8,000 men. How could I besiege this big ass king? <laughs> it's like, that's what Heron's thinking. He's like, how is he going to besiege this? Yeah. I wonder who Heron's remaining supporters were. It's entirely possible it was just other Ironborn, you know, but but it's not like every single house that joined in the Riverlands was, was accounted for when we heard that list of the tide turning. It was a lot of big names, Bracken, Blackwood, etc. But there's plenty of other houses we haven't heard about, smaller scale ones that would have felt less protected, ones that were maybe closer to the west. Like, what about the far west of the Riverlands, the ones on the shore? Yeah, Malister is an exception, perhaps, because they're so anti-Ironborn. But what about some of the other houses along the shore? They, they might be a little wary of flipping when they're so close to the Iron Islands. Like, yee, we're, we're in a sandwich here. We're nowhere near King's Landing or the egg on for it because there is no king's landing yet we're nowhere mm -hmm. near the base of this new king whatever i don't know what they called it at this point did they call it the egg on fort i guess but yeah so he a heron's like the guy that proverbial guy that buys a big fancy new truck or new car and just wrecks it the first time he drives it because <laughs> he's <laughs> he's way overestimated what it's capable of you know or what he's putting it up against in this case like immovable object meets immovable irresistible force no actually irresistible force force meets oh. burnable object 
<laughs> All very, very distinct. Think- you know, thinking about who might have still been, thinking about who might have still been sided with Heron. Oh, oh Sean Is it a lot of Sean's? You're cutting out right there. Uh, I would just move. I'll start I don't over. think we can hear your part at all. I think we need to move. You can't speak. We're we're too close to the end to deal with this. Okay. Also, I think you might have said Aegon's like that, but I think you meant Heron's like that. Oh, yeah, probably. That's why I was, yeah, I was just like, I'm <laughs> Heron's like the guy who got a big new truck. Yes, Heron yeah. is the guy. Nothing, Beleriand was not ruined, and nor was it new. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. But Heron Hall was. <laughs> yes, that is true. I did mean Heron. Okay, folks, that's a good stopping point for this week. We've covered right up to the point of the war. And as uh, as the beginning of the true uh, conflict of Aegon's conquest, the first major domino will fall. We'll have a lot to say about that, how it sets up such a example for the rest of the realm, and so many other things. We'll be having a lot of fun with that. There is another question we have here from Gerald Garcia. In the First Punic War, the Romans put a boarding ramp called a Corvus to their ships to board Carthage's ships. It worked. But when a storm hit their fleet, the Corvus unbalanced the ships and they sank. I do remember this. That's right. The Corvus, which is interesting because the Cor- Corvus is, is like Raven. For, uh, but it was a big old thing, like a, a large ramp with two big spikes at the end. And they would just get close to an enemy ship and drop it. And it would just smack down and pierce the enemy ship. And that get, the Romans were trying to use their advantage as a use their turn and disadvantage into an advantage, which was the Carthaginians had way naval superiority over them, and the Romans had way land superiority over the Carthaginians. So they were like, well, if we can use our soldiers in ship to ship combat, our soldiers will easily overwhelm their sailors. And that was true, but as Gerald Garcia points out, <laughs> it unbalanced all their ships, and once the seas became difficult, they lost the like the entire fleet of these Corvi ships and never built them again as far as i know <laughs> that was naval inexperience the, the carthaginians would not have made that mistake hopefully i'm coming through smooth right now yeah. but i'm guessing that's a parallel to the my talking about the scorpions problem right yes absolutely you're totally right yeah it is an exact building of, of that point yeah you're you're coming to find now so yeah folks we'll be back next week with more let's answer the trivia question for you remember the question was who what house were the uh Larry Moe and Curly men at arms sworn to. They were sworn to. Anyone get this? House Bracken is the answer. They were Bracken. They were Laris, L H A R Y S, Mohor, and Curlicut. Larry, yes. Larry Moe and Curly. People did get the Laris and the Mohor, M- Mohor part too, but they did not get the Curly, what, what Curly was short for. Ah, yeah, Curlicut. So if you remember them, Sean, those, were, those, those three guys were in Catelyn's party when she captured Tyrion at the at the end of the crossroads and then all three of them died in the mountains on the way to <laughs> the to uh, the Erie. I remember that sequence of course but I don't I, I didn't take note of those names yeah. so I appreciate being enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> so George has a longer history of this. This this was you know a lot more hidden than the Muppet Tullys which are just blatant like Grover Tully <laughs> Oscar Tully Elmo Tully yes <laughs> next week we'll you didn't even spell him with Y's and K's or anything yeah no yeah exactly just the exact same spelling yeah he's like you know what I don't need to hide this let's just go right out and do it <laughs> that's it's cited as an example I mean, maybe you've seen this in social media people people over exaggerate George's stories and say that it, he's nihilistic he's not he's like there are good like nihilism is like nothing is good like everything ends in despair and what's the point that they're not they're not like that at all Pe- the people I, have good endings and positive things can i say the funny thing with that the the those, those men at arms really are they're described like the actors too <laughs> yeah which i find funny oh their physical descriptions their physical description, match the three yeah, like mohor yes. mo has an iron like helmet an iron helm that makes him look like he has a bowl on his head <laughs> which is a bowl cut for mo <laughs> yeah. right yeah, yeah. laurie's yeah. 
has uh has uh wild tufts of rust colored hair that stick out of a conical cap so yeah he's got like the curly, curly had the uh, and then, oh, larry had the big hair yeah yeah larry didn't. had the big hair That's curly funny. is just a great fat oaf with short cropped hair and a pig's face and, and which, curly yeah. was a big guy yep that's yeah. right oh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> that's genius yeah. there's George. really great art of them on the wiki that someone oh. has done that squisher king has done nice. of each of them um anyway so that's pretty fun that is pretty fun <laughs> yep so you know one last note about Aegon's personality that i wanted to add i think maybe from a meta perspective one of the reasons George kept Aegon's personality a little undefined was because he's such a parallel to Danny. He wanted to maybe leave some of that undone so he could later write backfill some of those parallels a little more cleanly after he's developed Danny more. Like revert, like make draw the parallel back to Aegon rather than starting with Aegon and connecting it to Danny. Danny's the main character, not Aegon the Conqueror, even though he came before her. Like obviously she's the one that gets more focus and right he wants so. To be f- so he wants her to be fleshed out more than to create parallel or contrast to yes yeah. yeah or you're right contrast as well as parallel so so some of that like she hasn't even landed in westeros yet so like if we think about wow so we've gone really far with that well not not to this part of the story though like she hasn't she hasn't been in westeros except for when she was born <laughs> she's been in westeros for like a few days her entire life so yeah the, the parallels are already immense but let's not forget that there's room for a lot more and yeah george may not have wanted to write himself into a corner wanted to leave room for those later because after all he started this so long ago and he he knew it would be a while before she'd land on westeros even think even even if at first he thought it would be sooner than than 2023 <laughs> it's still he knew it would be a while so yes we will pick up next time not next week in two weeks time we'll be back for another live stream at three eastern join us for that or listen to or watch it after the fact you can do you have many choices in how you consume history of westeros podcast we mentioned a lot of episodes or alluded to a lot of episodes along the way here our valyria episodes of course house valarian and celtigar century of blood summer hall the doom we got an episode on Balerion. we got an episode on before the dragons we've got multiple episodes on under the dragons the rule uh, under the just after the conquest lots of things there as well thank you to anyone who supports us on patreon or as a spotify subscriber there's lots of ways to support the show you can also just tell your friends about us that's one of the best ways to spread word of mouth you are a better salesperson than you might think when you're discussing things that you care about a lot that is the heart of of bringing people over is enthusiasm for the thing that you are preaching about passion passion yes passion works true passion best of all and we certainly have a true passion for the world of westeros and the writings of george rr R. martin thanks as well to nina who also has that level of passion and obsession and we really appreciate everything she contributes to our show Thanks to Joey, Jesse, and Bran for the music and our intro. Thanks as well to Michael Klarfeld uh, for the same, as well as for the amazing maps you see behind us. And thanks as well to our Benjineer for audio quality assistance. Engineering sound like a Benjineer would. That's right. Well, until next time, my friends and fellow Westorians, Valar Reeves.